Hello everyone and welcome back to day 64 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, we are back, I guess, one, two, three, four, four streams after the, uh, the, the resumption of the, the streams. And uh, first I should mention that uh, I was intending to have a stream on Friday, but my mental clock is so broken that I literally thought it was the weekend and I was even telling people on the Discord and stuff, hey, how's your weekend going? When uh, that at the point when I asked that it had been Thursday, meaning they were nowhere near the weekend, because I thought we were already when I, when it was actually Thursday for some reason I thought it was Saturday, and so when it was actually Friday and I had a stream due, I thought it was Sunday, and I would totally have done a stream because I was kind of itching to do one, but you know by the time I realized it was already pretty late after the usual time, so apologies for that. The plan is to go back to the old schedule of three streams a week, maybe even with bonus streams, but three weeks sort of as a regular foundation. Um, and so Friday was just a hiccup trying to get back to the old cadence. All right, so um, uh, today's stream might get a little bit long because I do want to get through both some stuff I did over the weekend and actually start um, porting the compiler per, uh, proper. So um, um, First, let me just mention a few things about the cleaned up indexed array API. This will be pretty quick. There's a bunch of internal refactoring I did um, to support uh, uh, aligned allocation and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I won't bore you with the details of that. Uh, the code got cleaner in terms of splitting up uh, the intrinsics versus the, um, uh, the functions. Now the functions are kind of fully separated from the call gates. Previously, it was a mixture um, um, because I was trying to be cute and I was shouldn't have tried that. But um, the biggest thing that changed is, um, let's go look at some usage code maybe. Um, boom, 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 boom. The, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm trying to really centralize uh, this notion of the indexed array as a single unified data structure everything. Um, and so rather than trying to have this sort of weird split where you have you have you have a, uh, an A array, uh, but it's not, uh, but, but then you can also do indexing or whatever, I just decided, okay, let's just uh, really foreground this notion that it is a unified thing. And rather than having H get and K get and stuff like that, let's make them all the A functions, just to sort of foreground the fact that no, these really are the same data structure. It's just that you can index them in different ways. And in addition, um, you know, the 99%, uh, maybe not 99, 90% use case for anything associative is when you have a separate key and value as opposed to, um, you know, your index, like you have, you have a set where the whole value is the thing you're indexing on. Um, and so the new functions that are just like naked get and put are for key value mapping. And then if you want to get the set like only on the value, the whole thing, you use the V function. So get V, put V, and so on. So now it's just a put, which is nice and short. Um, and now it's, you know, it, it's always been a len even for those types of, of arrays. And now sort of everything is unified. A del for deletion. If you want to get the index, um, this is the old thing that was called h get. Now a get i gives you the index. Um, but I guess maybe I don't even have substantial tests for this. Let me just uh, actually write something for us right now. Um, this is an idea from Sean Barrett, and it's, the, the, it, it's actually the quote unquote obvious API, but it requires some implementation tricks to fully pull off. Um, so let me just ram this in. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what's a good example. Let's just do end to end. Um, so, suppose you have, uh, oops. Suppose you have, um, you have one of these maps and um, you want to do, you want to put some stuff in here. So for example, uh, I don't know, let's put in my birth date just as an integer. Uh, and then I guess how old I currently am, that makes no sense, but let's try something like that. So previously uh, you had to use a get i, or what would we now call a get i, which would give you an index. And so if you, um, if you do this, you would, um, I guess it has to recompile. Um, it would return zero, which is the current index. Um, if you, you know, if, if you try to do it for some 
for some non-existent key, uh, then you would get one, which is the current length. That might change to minus one or some central value, but for now I'm kind of doing what I normally do, which is to return, you know, past the end. Um, and so, okay, this is the old API. Now, the one thing that's annoying about this, of course, is that you have to actually do the indexing. And in most cases, you do just want to get the value, right? You, so you always want to do the lookup of the value. But because of the old API, this was a convenient way to do it polymorphically because it means that um, the return value is always the same. It doesn't have to depend on the type of the array. So it was a little bit of a simplification. And this thing is still very useful because remember the array itself can get reallocated. And so the only way to have a truly stable index, well, you have basically two ways to get an index that's stable into the array. It can be the key itself, which you, so you can always redo the lookup. Um, assuming you haven't deleted anything earlier in the array that would cause a swap deletion to potentially occur, the index is also a stable thing. The pointer is never stable. Well, it's stable if you don't realloc or you don't swap and delete, but, um, the, the the index is sort of the stable version of a pointer, right? So so this is always going to be useful. But in addition, we we can now just do um, a get i, um, um, or sorry, just a get, and this actually returns a value. So this one now has a polymorphic return value. It doesn't return an integer. It returns whatever the array element is. So you can see it gives me thirty seven. Um, now, if and, and this is where I, now it comes now we, we come to the point where that required a little bit of magic where I got some inspiration from Sean. Um, if you if you try this case for a non-existent key, um, then the 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 problem from an implementation point of view is that the only way to really do this is to return a pointer from the underlying function that the macro then dereferences. But in order to do that, there has to be something that has a variable size because the element, the array can have any size elements um, that, that can contain the default value. Um, and so the trick is you can actually just store the default value in the array itself um, because you already know the size and the alignment and so on in the array itself. So this will also give you proper alignment. It will just work. Um, and this has the side benefit of, um, I, I guess I didn't actually show you the value. Uh, so yeah, you can see you should get uh, y equals zero, which is the default value for everything. So by default, you always get zero. Um, however, you can actually set it to whatever you want. So in some cases, if a good, if you need a negative sentinel value because zero is a meaningful value in your domain, um, then um, if you redo the lookup, you should now see minus one, unless something. Oh, actually, let me just fix that button. I think it's because some of the names changed. Um, one second. So this should be TTV. Okay, so this is actually its own case. Let's just write that handler right now. Um, this should be next. I'm trying to keep them in the same order I have them in the file. Uh, so this is before a fill. Um, th this code is is obviously fairly ad hoc, just because I know it's going away in the new compiler. But it is a, it is at least more unified between the cases than previously. Um, let's see. So. Have the same stuff here, and then um, you need something of the value type. Let me just find one of those. Um, Uh, a lot of this stuff should be pulled into, like all of this stuff could be a function and blah, 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 but um, this code is going away very soon anyway. So uh, let's see here. I want to check that against the val, val type. Um, and actually, this should just be typoid because is the thing that 
set stuff. Um, argument one of the default. Eh, you know what? Let's not uh, rabbit hole. That's not even what I want to show. I'll fix this. This is a trivial thing, but let's not rabbit hole. It. But basically, the upshot is you can set arbitrary things here, um, and they will be used as your as your central values when you do a get. Um, and they're stored in the array before the header. And uh, one of the nice things about storing them before the header is that um, basically, if you plopper them accidentally, which would wreak havoc with the um, <laughs> It with with you know like you expect a get to return zero for example for a default values uh, now it returns random stuff you clobbered it with the, the quote unquote good news is that if that happens you've almost certainly clobbered the header as well so everything is going badly so it's not sort of like if it's a shared fate thing where uh, if, if that happens everything is going to hell because you just overwrote the header so uh, which I, which I think is actually like a, maybe that sounds like a bad thing, but that's actually a good thing because it means that you don't have cases where the array looks fine in the header, but then the default value is whatever. If the header has been clobbered, um, it will look like an empty array or something like that. Like if it's all overridden with zeros, it will look like an empty array. If it's overridden with garbage, um, you know, you know, like the index pointer, which is used to be associative lookup, will point to random memory and you'll get a memory fault. So. Um, even though that might sound uh, scary, uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's actually probably fine, but we will find out as we use it more. But anyway, so stuff like that happened. This is a pretty nice usability uh, improvement because like I said, you don't have to do any dereferencing of the index. I should also mention that you can do this. Um, if So for example, uh, if you do a get p, so that's for pointer, uh, a get p um, of, of an existing thing, Oh boy. Oh, maybe the old code didn't work. I just didn't. Okay, maybe a default actually worked. I just didn't. Okay, it did work. <laughs> so you can see, yeah, now you get minus one when there's a non existent key. So, yeah, let's try P. So, uh, P gives back nothing. Oh, it's because I typoed the key. Um, so yeah, a get P is nice when you just want to mutate the key or the value, because if you look here, you can see this is a pointer to the 32 that you put in. And of course, you can always mutate this in place. So say I get one year older, um, maybe I want to do, this feels weird. I guess it's actually right. No, it's not. I guess it do this. I'm going to change the length of pointer. The precedence is not right. <laughs> um, so now, you know, now you updated the value in place. And note that this very intentionally doesn't return a pointer to the whole key value pair because you never want to, when, when something is indexed, you never want to mutate the key in place because now uh, the array is inconsistent with the index. So it returns you a pointer. The other nice thing about this is, uh, you know, if I do if, if I do this for a non-existent key, pointer pointer types have a have a perfect sentinel value which is null. Uh, and so um, if you want to check whether something is in the array and you don't have sentinel values, this is also a good way to do it. Um, so you can see you get null now here in Q. So this means that rather than having, if you have a type that truly has no sentinel values, even if you just want to get values, but you don't have sentinel values to work with, an easy way to do that is to use, you know, like you could do something like this, uh, a get p, uh, 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 you can just do this, and then you can say, uh, I guess this would be not allowed because of shadowing restrictions. So yeah, stuff like that. So uh, these idioms are, you know, they, they just take the old convenience and, and take them to the next level. The, the, the thing, of course, you have to be careful about with pointers is that they're not stable if you do any kind of, um, uh, if, the, if the container has to grow, if the array has to grow, it gets reallocated. Um, but this is, if you just want to have sort of a, a local scope pointer, 
or you're, you are in a scope where you know that there's no none of that mutation going on that can potentially grow things, uh, then this is uh, by far the most convenient way to do things. So yeah, between a get and a get p, this covers like all the use cases in a really tight, compact way. So uh, pretty big usability improvement, even if it's sort of it seems pretty minor. I think th this will cut uh, you know a line of, or two of code uh, or a few tokens off of every single use case, uh, which really adds up. All right. So uh, enough about that. Let's talk about allocators. This is a big thing I worked on for a couple of days this weekend. Let me just see if there's questions before I move right on. Um, boom, boom, boom. Peaking pretty hard, yeah. So someone's saying the audio is, is being a problem. It must be a, a, a thing with my new external DAC that does magic under the covers. I'll investigate it after the stream, but thanks for letting me know. That's that's very good to know. I'll get that fixed. Um, all right, let's talk about the new allocator system. So previously, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is driven by me kind of going through, you know, the, I'm basically using the compiler as a forcing function, believe it or not, right? Like I've been working on this stuff for this week. Um, this is all stuff that in my mind always need to get done. And I'm using the opportunity of rewriting the compiler in order to ask myself, what's the What's the way I would want this kind of thing to be done in the standard library? So if you recall, in our old um, in our old Ion code, we, we had a I think we just had one custom allocator pretty much, which was the arena allocator, um, and we used it for I think the intern arena, and we used it for the AST nodes, and um, maybe a few other things. Can't quite remember, but. Um, a few, a few things that were lacking. So on the one hand, yeah, I want to be able to do the kind of thing we did, but I want to do it uh, more generally. Um, and one thing I want to do, I mean, it's a good example because we don't support it currently in this old stretchy buffer code, is that I want to be able to um, use custom allocators with stretchy buffers and other data structures. And I, I think it makes sense why that's important. Uh, if you have custom allocators at all, they, be, they need to be able to work with your data structures. And since we have our index arrays built in, they better be first class in terms of their integration with, with allocators. Um, and what, one annoying thing, I mean, there, there's a bunch of cases in the old compiler where I really wanted to use stretchy buffers with temp allocation, but there was no way to cleanly do it without changing the whole thing. And I liked how small they were in the old, old uh, implementation. But for example, like if you look at anywhere in the uh, parser, there's all kinds of buff push stuff, which is just temp scope. Like, for example, we're, we're accumulating a stretchy buffer uh, because we're dealing with an unknown length list of, of you know, uh, in this case, it's a function signature, but, you know, it can be all kinds of things. Anytime there's like a comma or a semicolon, it usually means that there's an associated list of variable unknown ahead of time length that you have to accumulate dynamically. Um, some people in those cases will use linked lists. Um, I mean, that's not terrible. The nice thing about linked lists is that each node is fixed length, um, and you know that that helps with that issue. Um, I, I personally like both the, the sort of the API, if you will, like the final shape and the intermediate form to be arrays, but it does require dynamic arrays in some shape. Um, but you, we could have done actually for a while. I was thinking of doing something like temp push. Uh, temp buff push, which would just be a temporary storage variant that used uh, a separate storage stack that you would uh, sort of save and restore when you started using it at certain points. Um, because that's all you need here, because basically the pattern we have in, in this, and this is totally typical, by the way, of a ton of libraries, is you have a temporary, well, one of the main use cases for dynamic arrays is this kind of case. You're, uh, the final array has a fixed size, so you don't really care so much about that. But the intermediate uh, data structure has uh, dynamic characteristics. You don't know how big it is in advance. You don't want to have to do a, a two-pass thing where you first find out the length and then you process it for real. So this is like, if anything, the use case in low-level code for dynamic buffers. Um, and there's no reason to really allocate them permanently. Um, you just want to allocate them temporarily. Like the way we do things here is uh, these constructor functions actually copy the buffer. So this buffer doesn't have to live past this function. Um, and so those cases, I mean, that's just a simple use case, but that's definitely something you want to support. And you don't want to have to bifurcate the whole array API into the temp version and the permanent version or whatever. You want to have just a unified thing that you can easily just add one line that says, okay, now use the same code 
but with my own allocator. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, so first, let me talk about maybe the user visible syntax because um, this also has a bunch of nice characteristics. So let me just show some 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 code. Um, basically, we have a new expression. And it works quite different from what you're probably used to, um, unless you're a C99 programmer who knows new macros, uh, which actually work on a very similar principle. The idea behind new, first off, is that the argument of new, which is person curly braces in this case, is an L value expression. So let me maybe write this out so we, you can see it side by side. These, these two parts are optional. The part that's never optional is the L value. This has to be an L value expression, right? What I mean, L value expression means an, it means a value that we can take its address, right? So it's not like the integer 42 is not an L value. That's just a mathematical constant. It's something that has a location in memory. Um, and the great thing about the syntax is not only does it cover the common use case, this is sort of the equivalent of you know C++ like this, maybe. Or not quite the equivalent because there's no constructors, but you know what I mean. Um, so what this does is it allocates a new person that's zero initialized. Now, because you can use any L value expression, you can also do this. You can make a copy of an existing thing. Whether that existing thing is an L value, maybe it's a local variable, or it's a pointer to another thing, you can just do this. So this type infers, this will make B a pointer to a person, so it'll have the same type as A, um, and it will copy its initial contents from A. So this just works. Um, and of course, this is not, and I, I want to emphasize because people thought this was ad hoc syntax. This is totally unified. This is just an L value expression, that's all. There's no special cases for, oh, this is a type, this is a DREF, this is a, a type with a, an initializer. It's all the same. Everything after the new is exactly the existing syntax. So in this case, this is just an L value literal, right? A compound literal uh, of type person where we initialize uh, name and age and then implicitly the, the other fields if there are any are zero initialized. Uh, and then we make uh, an allocated copy of that. So that's the, that's the syntax. There's no, obviously, in, in case you're coming from C++ or other languages, there's no constructor semantics. It's just copying. You're just copying an object, allocating it, inferring the alignment and size from the thing, from the type of the thing you're copying, and then just copying it, um, which is what you want. Um, and one nice thing about this is, you know, is like you don't have to pass the size of, and also this does alignment inf inf inference under the, the hood. So for custom aligned types, like SIMD types or whatever, this would just work. Um, you also need a way, a way to allocate to arrays of things. Um, and I should have mentioned, I'll show you the low-level API that corresponds to this in a second, but this is the high-level thing that you use 90% of the time at least, 95 maybe, maybe 100% in user code. So there's also a way to allocate arrays. Array types have the same type as the corresponding non-array new, right? They're just a pointer to a foo. Um, but under the hood, there are multiple copies of the thing. And the, the semantics here are copy semantics, but now it's fill. So you provide an L value as before, and then you make an array and you of a given size. Here I'm just using a random size to show the fact that this argument is dynamic. Um, and then it just fills that however many times. So if rand is 42, you get an array with 42 floats, each equal to 3.14. Um, now let's get to the custom allocator stuff. I'll talk about how allocators work in their interface in a sec. But for now, let's just say there's some allocators uh, that you can pass to certain functions. And um, the way you use custom allocators is it's the same new syntax, but now you can see this syntax line up here. There's an optional, the very first argument, if, there, if it's there, is the allocator. And this is a pointer to an allocator. Maybe I'll say allocator pointer. Um, and this should not be size, it should be length. Um, by the way, I don't know if I said this. When I say size, it always means byte size, pretty much. Length always means logical length, like in an array. Um, so yeah. Um, so now when you're doing new, you can just provide a pointer to an allocator. And uh, it's exactly the same. It'll just use that instead. OK? So let's, let's look at what this code does. Uh, I'll show you the implementation of temp allocator in a second. It's a few lines of code. It's very simple. But the, the logic here is the following. Uh, you want to allocate some stuff 
and by the way, this case is kind of silly because you could have allocated them just as local variables. It's just a test case. But you have some local storage, and this could be heap allocated as well. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. It's just a block of storage you want to use as, uh, as the source of an allocator's allocation requests. So you make a temp allocator from this block. You say, you know, I have 32 kilobytes, and uh, this is the, my base pointer. So then you get a temp allocator. This temp allocator itself, by the way, is not a pointer type. Right, so this doesn't involve heap allocation at all. Like no, nothing, in, nothing here involves heap allocation. Um, that's why we have to take the address of temp when we pass it to new. Um, so here we're saying, you know, do the same allocation we did previously, but now uh, allocate it out of the temp allocator, which will hit this block. Um, one of the nice things about temp allocators is that you can rewind them for free, like for free meaning in like one instruction. Um, so to go back to uh, our use case in the parser, which is extremely typical. Suppose you want to surround this region with like essentially a push pop of the allocator in the sense that when I return from the function, maybe I want to reset the, 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 the quote unquote temp stack pointer, the, the bump pointer as it's sometimes called, the, the high watermark for the temp allocator. I want to just reset that by snapping my fingers. So however much, not just from this function, uh, not just from this buff push here, but imagine there was other recursive functions in here that did temp, temp allocations using that allocator. Um, I want to just reset everything to the way it was when we come out. And you can do this at however fine or coarse granularity you want. So you can do it at a function level like this, but actually even better would be to do it at the declaration level in our case, because declarations tend to be fairly bounded in size, like maybe, um, you know, uh, a few hundred bytes or something like that on average. And so um, you would only really need to reset the temp allocator mark at the parse decal level because um, there's not going to accrue too much temp allocation even if you just let them pile up in that interval. So, but the point is in, in sort of a nested stack uh, shaped form, you would have these temp begin and temp end markers. Uh, and so in this case, what we're doing here is we're recording the state of the temporary allocator um, and then we're doing, we're actually creating a second allocator, which is our old arena allocator. But now the arena allocator is using the temp allocator as its upstream allocator, which is a little bit silly, but it's just a, an example. So you have an a, a arena allocator that's allocating out of a temp block. Um, and so we do a bunch of allocations here. You can see we do a big uh, array allocation of, of, of a number between zero and a thousand floats. And then rather than freeing the arena, we don't have to do that. We could do that. Rather than freeing the arena, we just reset the temp mark because we know that everything the arena did memory-wise is going to come from our temp allocator, and so, so we can just reset the state to where it was. And let me now show you how simple the temp allocator is. I mean, it's if, if you remember how we did the um, the other allocators, it shouldn't come as a surprise. It's inherently simple. Um, a temp allocator. I'll talk about the allocator interface more maybe in a second, but basically. This is OO style stuff in the sense that you have a common prefix, uh, a first field. Every allocator has a first field of type allocator. And this lets you do legal C memory aliasing to do certain OO type things in terms of the dispatch. Um, it doesn't use a V table because there's no pointer to allocator. It's just the actual function pointers in line in that function in in this struct. But anyway, in terms of its own uh, special state. It has three parts. It has the base pointer for the array that it got passed, the next, which is where the next allocation will come from, and the end, which is you know the upper bound of uh, the array it was passed in. Um, when you do a temp allocation, you can see here, this is the, the, the quote unquote virtual function. Um, it gets passed the void star. This is just an allocator. Um, but you know, if unless you pair temp alloc illegally with something else, this will always be something of type temp allocator. Um, and so you get past the size and alignment that is uh, requested. And so you just you do this cast, and this cast is legal because um, in C and in Ion, like I said, a pointer to a struct is interconvertible with a pointer to the first field. In fact, recursively. So you can also convert to a pointer to the field of the first field or something like that. Um, so this is what we're exploiting here. Um, even though you, you basically what this means is you can you can cast you can legally cast temp allocator to allocator because allocator is the first fields type in temp allocator. 
this is a fairly standard trick for O, O, and C. It's very useful. Uh, and I actually use it, I plan to use it in at least one other case uh, in the standard library. Um, but um, this is basically the idea. And so uh, once we've done this cast, we can just get out our own specific state, like the next pointer and so on. And here we do the kind of alignment stuff we've done before. But uh, in this case, if after doing the alignment and uh, figuring out how far we need to go to satisfy the size, um, if it turns out we don't have room, we always return zero because this is a bounded buffer. Maybe it should be called bounded allocator or something. I, I, I typically just call it a temp allocator. But it's a bounded buffer, which means once you run out of space, there's no way to go. Um, so it doesn't go and ask for more. It, it, it just says, no, I can't satisfy your request, sorry. So this is great if you want to, for example, you have a, a, another library you're using and you want to give it a memory budget. Assuming that library is written in a robust way, and we'll talk about that actually in, in the next topic, written in a robust way where it can recover cleanly from, say, memory allocation failures deep in a call stack or something, then this lets you use a third-party library with a fixed memory, giving it a fixed memory budget out of a fixed block that you control the location of. Um, and if it fails, then, you know, it's like, well, sorry, I, I couldn't do the job you asked me to do given the memory you gave me. And that's the kind of thing you actually want it to do. You don't want it to just grow unbounded in that case. You want to be able to say, sorry, I have only 100, you know, I have like 1K to give you. And if you can't do the job, well, I guess I have to deal with the fact that you couldn't finish the job somehow, right? Like, so that's kind of the idea. Um, this is really a bounded allocator in that sense. But that's just all you're doing. Um, and so, yeah, let me show you how this temp allocator constructor function works. Um, it takes a, we, this is the thing we were using before to actually construct a temp allocator from a buffer and a buffer size. So you're given a buffer and a size, and um, you can see here, we fill in this initial field with just the two function pointers for these two functions we've implemented. Actually, not free does nothing because this is a static buffer, so we don't have to free it. But uh, temp alloc does this, and, um, and that's it. So this is the constructor. Um, and you can see it's just, it's not, allocating anything it's just returning a value um, and then here's how you do the be begin end stuff for, for, for setting and resetting the mark uh, it just gives you the current value of next in this mark struct the reason I make it mark is just so you don't accidentally pass the pointer to something else that expects a pointer um, so this is supposed to be kind of a pig you're not supposed to look at it it's just in order to hand it back to the API so you get it from begin and then you hand it back to end and all it does is it just sets the mark uh, it just sets the next pointer back to where the mark says. And it does some sanity checking to make sure that you're not passing it at bogus memory. Um, which is, by the way, in this case, a pretty good sanity check because a given buffer is going to be a very small slice of, say, a 32-bit or certainly 64-bit address space. Um, so, so this has a very good chance for a reasonably sized buffer to, to catch uh, memory clobbering. But yeah, so that's it. That's the whole allocator. Uh, it fits on one page, including the interface to you know, with the, the, these two functions, this function table. Um, that's the temp allocator. Someone's asking if alignment is a power of two. Yes, it is. Alignment is always a power of two, and that's going to be enforced. And that's sort of the only reasonable way you can do alignment quickly. Otherwise, you have to do divisions, which is not quick. Uh, if uh, you can do divisions by constants, if you know, no, yeah. So anyway, uh, no, you, you can't do quick alignment, so it has to be powers of two. Right now it's not, I'm going to basically enforce it that everywhere, uh, what you call it? Everywhere I can statically enforce that you can specify an alignment, it's going to be power of two checked basically. But if you pass something dynamically, it's, it's your own fault. Maybe in debug mode, the entry point to the allocators uh, will have uh, an assert, but yeah, it has to be a power of two. Um, all right, so that's the temp allocator. Let's revisit the arena allocator and let's compare it to our old version. So this is exactly, just to remind you quickly, this is exactly the thing we had before um, in our old code. Um, our new code is a little bit bigger, I guess, but uh, only because, well, it has to handle alignment and also I chose not to use these macros. If you unfolded these macros, it would be exactly the same size. Um, so the difference is if you look at our old arena alloc, it hard coded the call to X malloc and X free or not X free, just free. So it, it's upstream allocator was always the system allocator, which is totally fine in a fixed case. 
in this kind of standard library case, you don't you want to have it be reusable um, and composable. And so um, you hand it an arbitrary allocator. Like in, in, in the example I showed before, we were handing it a temp allocator, which is very weird. You wouldn't do that. You would just use the temp allocator directly. But um, I mean, for example, in the unlikely case that someone really, like you have a function you have to call it, a pre-existing function that wants an arena allocator, like it has, a, it really wants a specific arena allocator as opposed to just an arbitrary allocator. Well, you could make one that's working out of a temp allocator. Like that's the kind of thing you can easily do. But anyway, um, oh yeah, there's one other thing I changed about it, but, but it's basically the same thing as before. So if you look at the alloc function, it's basically the same as the temp allocator with the, the only difference being that rather than just returning zero when you run out of space in the current block, it allocates a new block. That's the only difference. Um, in terms of the, the fast path. So the fast path is as cheap in both cases. It's just, you know, alignment, uh, uh, alignment and uh, bounds check, and then that's it. And the fast path is, of course, it never hits this case. Uh, one, so a few things changed in the growth function, but very minor. The big thing is that I now do, and, and it will probably allow some tuning around the concrete growth rates or whether you want to really have geometric growth rate or linear growth rate or not grow at all. But um, one difference is that if you look at the old arena, we had a fixed block size and here it's a megabyte, which is appropriate when you have knowledge of the kind of use cases you're using it for. And every time you, you, um, every time you grow, you always ask for the same size block. It's always arena block size, right? Um, if you want to do a general purpose arena allocator, um, you can do it a little bit more nicely by basically doing the same amortization trick that people normally do when growing dynamic arrays, which is basically you, you increase, in this case, I'm just doubling it for simplicity, but increase the block size um, by some geometric factor every time uh, you're, you're asked to grow, which means that uh, in terms of the final required size to satisfy the whole sequence of requests, the whole history of requests in the end, uh, will uh, only require a logarithmic, will, will basically not require any more, it's like I'm amortized constant time, basically. Like this is not necessarily, the old version we had was not amortized constant time. If for whatever reason you had a mix of, uh, like if, if, this, if the size of the block, uh, of the initial block size was totally out of step with the actual allocation requests, then um, things would not really adapt to that. And this thing does adapt to that. Um, basically, uh, it will uh, double the block size um, every time it tries to reallocate. Um, and so, for example, if you allocate a gigabyte with something like this, and even if the block size, so in this case, just for testing, I'm starting the block size stupidly small, which is way too small in practice, but this will force it to grow a ton to satisfy any, any basic requests. Um, it will basically start small and it will grow over time. And so even if you're asking it to allocate a gigabyte, that's only 32 doublings, right? Uh, or a gigabyte would be 30 doublings. So even for starting from small uh, eight byte blocks like this and going to actually eight byte would be, I guess it would be 30 minus three, so it would be 27 doublings. Uh, it would only be 27 growths in order to go from an eight byte initial block size to a one gigabyte final block size. Um, so same sort of amortization trick. The downside of this approach is the amount of wasted space is a percentage of the final space as opposed to a fixed number. So in our old case, if you have a block size of one megabyte, even if you allocate one gigabyte with it over time, you can never waste more than one megabyte, essentially, in some sense, um, because there's one block left over and maybe there's maybe it's almost totally empty except for one byte or something, a very small piece at the beginning. So at most you're wasting one block, which is always fixed size. In our case, just like with dynamic arrays, you're potentially wasting, well, you're wasting a percentage and you can tune the percentage so in the case of power of two growth, the worst case percentage is 50% of the um, of the final size of, of the used size that's uh, allocate actually allocated. On average, it's 25%. Um, if you make the growth factor 1.5, which is quite common, then the um, the average case uh, sorry the worst case is 25%, and the worst case is 12.5%. So you can tune this, and you can also just use a different a block size strategy like you can make it totally non-adaptive always just have a constant like we will allow you to configure that later but as a turnkey allocator this is nice because it adapts to the dynamic load as opposed to having to hard code assumptions about block sizes and stuff like that so anyway that's the main difference from the um, 
from the previous uh, version. Uh, and then rather than using X malloc and just calling the system allocator directly, we use this function generic malloc alloc. Generic alloc is just the counterpart of new that we saw before. Uh, it takes an allocator argument, a size and an alignment. Uh, and so this is just sort of a dispatch function for the underlying uh, allocator. Um, and you can see if that fails, we fail too. So it is possible for the read allocator to fail if the upstream allocator fails. So for example, if we are coupled to a temp allocator and we try to grow and uh, grow into a new block and we can't get space for that from the temp allocator, then this will propagate the zero up. Um, but it will at least try, it will, it, it will keep trying to make new blocks as long as the upstream allocator will, uh, will give it to them, give it to uh, the arena allocator. So anyway, but this is basically what we we're doing before. You can see we're even using temp, uh, even using ABA. Uh, it, we're even using uh, stretchy buffers in the same way. Um, it, with with this function, you're never calling arena free on end. You're never calling free on individual allocations. You have to call it on the whole arena. And the way freeing the whole arena works again is as before. You you iterate over all the blocks you've built up, and then you have to free them with the underlying allocator. Uh, and then you free the array that contains the blocks, uh, the block pointers. So uh, that's it. It's very similar to what we had before, um, except that you know we're doing some of these clamps and, and min max stuff uh, kinds of things inline, and we're using actual alignment, configurable alignment, and we're using a generic upstream allocator. But otherwise, it's the same code. Um, and so let me show you something really cool you can do with this. So here we're just showing kind of standard allocators. Temp and Arena are probably the two, two most, the two simplest kinds I know of. Um, by the way, I know people have seen this on Casey's stream and maybe on my previous streams and, and, and Sean McGrath's streams. Um, one really nice way of using a temp allocator is if, on systems that have 64-bit uh, virtual memory, uh, which is like high, you know any reasonable modern system basically, but not embedded systems uh, like the ones we're going to be working on later, which is why I'm not building this in as sort of a standard well, I'm, going, I'm going to have it built into the library as an option, but it's not going to sort of assume you have this available on your platform. But a really nice way of doing a temp allocator is to uh, reserve a really worst case bounded thing. Like even if you only think you need a, a megabyte, uh, ultimately, um, say you reserve one gigabyte from the virtual memory system. And that basically has zero cost because the way that stuff is stored in the, uh, in the kernel is that it just has a big range tree and all the ranges of uncommitted things that have homogeneous properties for the pages are just stored as a single interval. So if you ask to reserve one gigabyte of virtual memory, all that looks all that looks like in the kernel's data structures is there's an interval that says start address, end address properties, because the properties are the same for every single page in that interval. So a reservation of arbitrary size has the same cost as long as it's totally homogeneous. Um, and then you can start committing it on demand, which basically sort of truncates or snips off a part of that um, interval and actually commits some of it to the page table and so on. And actually, on Windows, even when you commit stuff, it doesn't necessarily commit it to the low-level hardware page tables. It, it still keeps, it, it just records a new interval that says the left part is committed, the right part is still reserved. And then if there's an actual page fault, it will then do a search against the interval tree to find that the address fell in the committed portion, do on command committing and stuff like that. That's how you do over memory over commit, for example, if you've heard about that concept. But anyway, uh, a really good way of exploiting that for doing these sorts of temp allocators is you reserve a really big worst case memory range, virtual memory range, and then you commit it on demand. Um, and so that way you can have a really conservative overestimate of how much you'll need, but you actually only need to commit the amount you really use. Um, and so this is a way to use temp allocators without having to be super conservative or without actually committing too much memory. Uh, you can be really conservative in your reservation and then be very specific with your commitment range. Um, and so on 64-bit modern systems with good virtual memory systems, like certainly Windows, Linux, Mac, you can do all this very efficiently. Um, that's often the way to do things. But like I said, it only really works on higher end 64-bit systems, which we're not going to assume is just the way things are because we're doing embedded work as well. Um, but just wanted to mention that since people keep bringing up why, like I remember when I did the arena allocator originally, people were asking, why don't you do, why don't we do everything with linear allocators like Casey? And the answer is linear allocators like that are really great if, um, if you're on 64-bit. And that's how I do everything high performance on 64-bit, but we're not just doing 64-bit. Anyway. Um, 
All right, yeah, so, so these are just sort of low-level allocators. Let me show you some higher-level stuff you can do extremely easily on top of this model. Um, and actually, let me call it something else. I think this should be called trace allocator. I realized that after the fact. Let's rename this uh, trace alloc. Um, so this would be trace allocator. Trace free. Trace. Trace, 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 unlock. Um, so you can build simple debugging tools like this or instrumentation tools like this. So here's an allocator. Um, it's a, just like with the arena allocator, it's associated with an arbitrary upstream allocator that actually serves the underlying requests. And what it's going to do is it's going to have a buffer of all the events it's seen. So it has this uh, dynamic buffer of allocator events. Each allocator event can either be an alloc or a free, and each of them stores when they occurred, what what was the corresponding pointer. Uh, by storing the corresponding pointer, you can not only correlate it with maybe application debug info, but you can also correlate these two things with each other. After the fact, you can link up which of them correspond to each other and which, for example, which pointers were leaked um, by you know correlating the allocs and the free pointers, basically. Um, and the size and alignment, which, which is only stored for the alloc events. For free events, there's no corresponding size and alignment because we don't know it. Only the upstream allocator knows it. Um, and so when you do a, a, an allocation, all you do is you just forward the request upstream and then you record an event. And the event just contains the data. Like, look how trivial this is. Um, and similarly for the free, it just records an event. Um, uh, and, and a small trick here is since we're using a dynamic buffer, for the um, we're using a dynamic buffer for the um, for the events, and we, we really have to use a dynamic buffer. We don't know how much will be needed, right? So it has to be dynamic. Uh, this thing also needs to be allocated. Normally, things are just implicitly using the system allocator, uh, actually what's called the current allocator, but you can think of it as a system allocator for now. Um, but now, if you call this function a and it, I mentioned before that you want to have the ability to plumb through. Uh, any custom allocator to your stretchy buffers, and now you can. You can just call a and it. You don't have to call a and it. If you don't call a and it, it will do the usual uh, impl uh, lazy initialization the first time you try to do a mutation, like a pushing something onto a list. Um, but if you so, so this would be totally legal. But if you do this now, the events themselves are are serviced out of the upstream buffer. Um, I think in the future, what you probably want to do is you either want to use the system allocator for this or you actually want the ability to specify an optional event allocator because sometimes the allocator you're trying to trace is a very specific thing and you don't want to interleave requests that are truly different downstream with requests that are from you because you have to get more data for your event buffer. But um, I just wanted to il illustrate that um, you, you can, you can, when you're trying to be more explicit about where things go, you can do that sort of thing. So, so you could have an additional argument that's like the event allocator, and then I could use the event allocator here. And if you don't specify an event allocator, I just use the system allocator, for example. Um, actually, let's do that now, because I think that's almost always what you want. Um, in fact, you could just do this. That's totally legit. Because if you specify null, it always means the current malloc. So you don't even have to check it here. Um, it's valid to pass it null for that. So yeah, so, so that's how it is. And let me show you how you actually use it. Um, it's, you use it exactly like all the other allocators. Um, logging allocator. This would be trace allocator. Oh yeah, this is a particularly cool trick. Um, so also lets me explain the whole current versus whatever. Um, you can replace the current allocator, which is just the system allocator, basically the thing that everyone uses by default. You can replace that with, with something of your own choosing. You have to be extremely careful about doing this, by the way. This is only, you, you typically only want to do this at the very top level in your application, like the main function, because what can happen otherwise is that 
Someone will allocate something during a function call in a third-party library, install a pointer, and then later we'll expect to be able to free it with the current allocator, but now the current allocator has changed, and so it'll get out of sync. So you want to be very, very careful. This is sort of a low-level thing you don't want to do carelessly, but it's very useful to do, at the, for example, the top level to a main function to trace all allocations or something like that. Or if you have a library that you have, you're willing to take life into your own hands and say, yes, I believe that by the time this thing returns, uh, or by the time this piece of code finishes, when I reset the current allocator to its previous value, I truly believe that there are no outstanding installed pointers to allocations that were just made that would get totally borked once they try to free it with the changed current allocator. So you can do it in those cases if you're willing to take life into your own hands, but the useful case for overwriting current allocator is doing it right at the top level main function, because then before anything happens, you can take control of the allocator flow. Um, so yeah, uh, so this is what we do here. We make a new trace allocator. It's going to trace the current allocator. So it will basically use the, the, the whatever the current allocator is, is what it will trace, which would normally be just the upstream malloc and free from libc. Um, and so now we, we set our trace allocator as the current allocator. And then we do a bunch of, of, of okay, did I just blow some code? sec. Let's see what this is. What did I change? Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I know what the issue is. Um, Let's do it this way. Um, this is why you have to be careful about stuff. The problem is, if you specify null as the allocator, it will use the current allocator, which is itself, and so it's going to get into some kind of recursive loop. Um, that's probably why I did it in the first place. OK, let's see if this works. OK, that worked. So now we've, we've gone through a bunch of allocations. Uh, and you can see there's actually two kinds of allocations happening. There's the explicit allocations here, where we're saying alloc. The alloc function implicitly uses the current allocator. So before I showed you generic alloc, which is when you specify the allocator, if you just call alloc, that just means use the current allocator. Um, and the second argument here is alignment, by the way. Um, but so there's those allocations, but there's also implicit allocations from putters because all of the stretchy buffer stuff is using the current allocator as well if you don't specify any overriding one. So all of this stuff uh, is, is introducing allocations and then we do some explicit freeze and then we finally free the stretchy buffer as well. And then we set the current allocator back to what it was. And um, if you now go and look at a trace, Let's see here, uh, standard a trace. Let's just do something like this. Anyway, so now you have a, uh, a bunch of events that record all everything that happened in that interval. That was just everything in that interval that was doing default allocations. So you could, you could, like I said, you could put this at the top of your main and just get a trace of everything. Uh, it's a much, it, it you know it will obviously won't trace like if you're calling like random C code that uses malloc and free it won't override the libc malloc and free um, so it's not it's not like doing the standard LD preload hack or code injection hack on Windows or something like that um, this is for doing things that are in the purview of Ion which means we can generally do a better job about um, you know keeping track of things downside is of course we can't trace stuff that's in libc. Um, if you want to do that sort of whole application tracing, you should really be using not a language level approach, but something like XPerf or, or Prof on Linux or something. You should use something that's actually looking at the whole process from the OS point of view, not from the library or language point of view. But um, this is, from, from within the language library point of view, this is a good way to just kind of capture everything. And so you can see here, uh, zero means alloc, and you can see the timestamp 
um, we're using the built-in libc time, which is obviously terrible resolution, so we can't see shit from this. Um, you would normally use a high-performance, uh, high-resolution uh, timer, but you can see that uh, there's different pointers here. And you know, for example, if we go and look at the very last, uh, why? Okay, this. I guess this would be the last one, right? Uh, the, the other stuff is is garbage. So this is the very last one, and you can see that this is a free because it's kind one. Um, the pointer is, let's see, so this is C30. Um, I would expect this to be the second allocation overall um, because the first one would be, like when you do your A push, so let's see, maybe not. Uh, Anyway, I'm not sure why that's not showing up that way. But anyway, you see the idea. And uh, the, the point I want to make is not like that I wrote this amazing thing called trace allocator because this is about as simple as it gets, although it gives you basically all the data you need. It gives you basically all the data you need to post-process for doing tools. Like, for example, think about what you could easily write once you have this event list. You could write, um, you could write a, a tool that gives you, for example, a graph over time of memory usage. It could... Uh, calculate, you know, so we, by just taking the prefix sums of everything, of, of sizes, like basically what you will do in the post-processing stage is you will build a hash table based on the pointers so that you can correlate the, free, the allocs and frees. And then every time you see a free, you will subtract as you process things in sorted order. Um, every time you see a free, you will look up the pointer from the free event in the hash table, find the corresponding alloc event, and then uh, mark that as being freed uh, so that, you know, for leak tracing, whether it's free or not, and then subtract the size of that allocation from the current memory usage. And this way you get a graph of current memory usage through this allocator over time. A along the way, you can also uh, accumulate other aggregate statistics like the average uh, various percentile statistics and so on. Um, and then at the end, the final allocation size is going to be the amount of final leak memory and the pointers that have not been paired up with a free um, will be, um, um, will be the uh, leaked allocations. So if you then also had um, some additional metadata, maybe from a shallow stack trace that you could add to this code, uh, you would then be able to say, oh, this pointer that leaked of this size came from this part of the allocation. And typically what I do for that is, well, the simplest thing you can do is you can just sort of pass, you can do the usual macro things he does is where you pass a func, you know, the, the underscore func and underscore line macro CPP defines. Um, that doesn't actually work that well in practice because in many cases there's an intermediary that does allocations on someone else's behalf. And so knowing that, you know, the general function did the allocation is almost useless. So typically what you want to do is you want to have a configurable depth stack trace where you can say for your application, you know, for example, show me the, like capture the last three functions on the, on the call stack and attach them to the event. Um, and that way you get a little more context, which is usually enough to figure out who did it. And you want to be able to configure this per application so that in some applications, maybe depth one is actually fine and that's cheaper to capture. Um, but in other cases, maybe you need to go three or four deep if you're the kind of person who writes a lot of nested functions to do stuff. Um, but the point is, once you do that, you can write all these tools almost trivially. In fact, you could write them in ION very easily, and maybe we'll do that later, um, just using this log of events. And um, again, the point is not that this is an, an amazing piece of code. The point is, look how trivial it is. This is the, the, like this fits on one screen. So that's 40 lines of code for a tracing allocator. You can plug it in at the system level uh, or at the app level by overriding current allocator. You can also plug it into a library. Like for example, suppose you have a suspicion that a specific library leaks memory. Uh, then what you can do is you can wrap an allocator in a trace allocator and you can do a leak. You can just do a leak check on that allocator. Like you can do the same thing I just described, but rather than doing it, you know. But now it will apply not to the whole application's memory usage, but to the specific library that you handed the allocator to. And so, you know, it's so easy to do that stuff if you just have the infrastructure to deal with it. Um, anyway, so hopefully that's convincing. We'll do a bunch more of these allocator type things over time, but I think these are kind kind of three three cases that show the power of this simple system.
Um, and it's so easy to plug into use cases because all, all our, keep in mind, all our, all our um, dynamic arrays, hash maps, slash maps uh, and, and sets, they're all one data structure. They're just the array, the indexed array. And you plug things into that by using a init um, or by overriding current allocator if you want to take life, life into your own hands. Um, and for, uh, for other things, you pass them explicitly as allocators. Like new, you can pass it explicitly as an allocator. Um, if you want to build other data structures, you will, you know, they will do the same thing. Anyway, enough rambling about that. Um, I just wanted to go over it in case you haven't seen this sort of thing before. Uh, one thing I actually want to mention, because people might have seen the way STL does allocators, which is an abomination. Um, one of the huge mistakes ST, the C++ STL did in its allocator design for containers is that they, um, maybe I can bring it up. This won't be a huge duration, but it's kind of a notorious case. And they tried to fix certain things over the years, but the basic design is the fundamental problem, which they can't change without breaking completely. Um, look, they freaking, they statically parameterized by the allocator. The implications of this were so staggering, guys. You have no idea how bad. This single decision ruined, basically for game developers to a large extent, ruined the STL. That's not, actually that's not true. Because the thing you can do, and which a lot of people do, is the thing you plug in here is always the same type, and then that type does dynamic dispatch under the cover. Because what you want to do in practice, always, what you always want to do in practice for this kind of param parameterized allocation approach is you want it to be dynamically parameterized. You don't want it to be statically parameterized. The problem with statically parameterizing it is now the types are incompatible. It also leads to code bloat for no good reason, but the types are incompatible. That's a huge fucking problem. You can define conversions and stuff, but it's a huge mess and you get code bloat and it's just, it's a nightmare. I actually don't know what this is. Maybe, maybe this thing is actually fixes some of the issues, but in typical C++, yeah, I'm sure it's a disaster like everything else related to allocators and SDL. But um, anyway, game. The, 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 the thing I find funny about this is that, you know, game developers are usually sort of, uh, you know, people say, you know, oh, we hate any form of dynamic dispatch. Everything is always sort of statically instantiated and whatnot. But going back to at least the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, all the people who did a better version of this kind of concept of containers with configurable allocators, all of them did it by, I mean, basically the kind of thing I did, maybe not the exact details, but the same idea of having dynamic function pointer dispatch rather than static instantiation where everything is fully, un, you know, everything is fully um, inlined or whatever. Um, because like, okay, look, an indirect function call through a function pointer, it's not free. But it's pretty, but it's pretty cheap. Like the cases where you can't afford to have um, a, a static function call for an allocation are the cases you shouldn't have a parameterized allocate. Like for example, there are absolutely cases where you want to use an allocator in a really tight loop. Oops. Like, like let me write some code where you want an allocator in a really tight loop, like um, you know, like this, um, and you want to do I don't know. I mean, I don't know. This is maybe unrealistic, but, but just to really hammer it home, suppose you're doing the moral equivalent of this. You're doing a bunch of four byte allocations. Maybe they're variable size, but there there's a ton of them and there's very, they're very small. In this case, this, this is going to be expensive to do with the, like function calls relative to how fast they could be otherwise if you knew that you were targeting like a bump allocator that just has to do a pointer increment in order to satisfy this request. But those cases are so rare that when you encounter them, what you should do instead is you should do this, right? In other words, the cases that require very, very specific performing characteristics to be reasonable need to hard code. Like that's engineering guys. Like you have to make decisions. The, the stuff that's parameterized like is, 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 is great, but you should optimize when, when you're parameterizing stuff. You should optimize for the case where parameterization is reasonable, which is basically the generic case. And in the generic case, your allocations, you know, even if you have a temp allocator that just does a pointer increment and a bounce check under the covers, a function call for that for normal size allocations is like a drop in the bucket. It's not something you worry about. The cases where you would worry about the indirect function call overhead is for something like this. But in this case, if you wrote this code with a generic parameterized allocator, you're crazy. Like you should be doing, you know, or not even this, you should just be doing, you know, like, 
whatever. You should be doing this or something, right? Like you should be doing something very specific if you have very specialized performance demands. But the SDL kind of tried to have it both ways and got neither in the process. Anyway, um, notorious design screw up in SDL that haunts them to this day, I'm sure, um, because a lot of that stuff can't really be adequately backpatched. Because even even if you provide a polymorphic allocator that is just the generic allocator you plug in, you still have all the legacy gunk and you still have to uh, deal with the fact that std vector is parameterized by it it's it's, it's a freaking mess anyway I'm, i feel myself getting all hot and bothered so uh let's move on i think that's enough about allocators this has already gone on for an hour this will be a long stream because i want to start writing some code and not just cover stuff i did but all this other stuff is i think important um all right um Recovery. Okay, so let me let me before I talk about my what the, ex the experimental design I've been working on and, and I already have working. Let me talk about the problems it's really designed to solve first and foremost. It turns out it actually solves I think a much broader class of problems, but I want to talk about the motivating incident, the 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 cases that I know from experience are important to handle um, in order to be able to write simple code that can handle robust error recovery. Um, for libraries and modules, not for functions, but for libraries and modules. Um, uh, memory safety guarantees, no, I hate memory safety. Uh, I try to make it less memory safe than C. I try to have more implicit pointer casts than C. Uh, and that's not to say that this isn't a good idea for some languages, but uh, I hate programming in languages like that. I don't like memory safety at all. I, I, I want it to be less memory safe than C. Uh, I already have more things planned that make it less memory safe than C. Um, so, um, boom, boom, boom. what was I going to say? Right. So if you, let me talk about the kind of code you'd like to write. Um, if you look at how we do error handling, some of these are bad examples in a certain sense that you could recover from them if you wanted to, to have a different error recovery strategy and it would be reasonable to do so in a compiler. But um, let me talk about the kind of thing you want to be able to do broadly, it's at least for some classes of errors, maybe not for parse errors, which is what I'm going to be talking about, but certainly for some classes of errors. Um, right now, we have uh, a pretty shitty, not shitty, actually, it's been fine for me, at least when I've been writing ion code. I haven't been lamenting the uh, way we do error reporting. The way we do error reporting is there's some things that are warnings, and warnings are generally things that we can easily just like we can easily continue execution without bothering about the state being uh, violated in some way. Like we don't have to worry about cleaning things up or something. It's just like something we see that looks suspicious. We can report it as a warning. But right now, all errors, uh, even in the parser, where we're probably going to add more, we're, we're going to definitely, actually, let me say definitely, we are going to add error recovery uh, as opposed to just bailing out hard. But um, But let's just use this as an example. Right now, if you do error here, it goes into this top level error function um, and ultimately it does fatal. Wait, doesn't it do fatal? I guess fatal error does fatal. <laughs> okay, fatal error does fatal. Um, so fatal error is just you do error and then you exit and I guess this should actually be abort, but right you know, a board has a, well, yeah, it, it should be a board, actually. Um, but but this is the kind of error handling we're doing for fatal errors. And there are a lot of things that are useful to make fatal errors. Like you have to think about the UI experience and that's where um, I am going to do better error recovery in the parser. Like the easiest way to do error recovery is just to bail on the current declaration. Um, the reason you can bail on the current declaration pretty easily is that for function definitions, you don't really care about the definitions uh, outside of the function itself. Uh, you can call any function as long as you know their declaration. So as long as you can parse the signature line of a function declaration, for example, uh, if you, as long as you can do syntactic, you, you can do kind of lexer state recovery or whatever you want to call it, cursor recovery up to the top level of the declaration. It's actually very easy to do that without polluting the rest of the system with uh, checks. Um, things that are harder involve, uh, include uh, types. Um, if you have a struct definition, then you can resolve it. If, even if the declaration body is broken, 
but um, but you can't complete it. But even that is actually not hard to recover from because all you do is you set a single bit that says this thing failed parsing, and then if you try to complete it, then you throw an error, a fatal error at that point. So there's various things I'm going to do that are very lightweight and will handle 99% of the cases you want it to handle. But there are many cases in a library, and it's especially true in recursive code like this, where you have this very deep call stack and something bad happens, and you want to be able to do the equivalent of just calling abort, which, uh, which bails out hard. Now, the thing about abort is it's really convenient because it essentially just punts the job to the OS, right? The OS is responsible for cleaning up all the processor's resources. I don't have to worry about tearing down any resources. I don't have to worry about unwinding the stack function by function, right? I don't have to worry about propagating an error code up every level of the stack and having all of those functions have some way of propagating the error to their caller and so on recursively. I don't have to do any of that. On the other hand, uh, once you're making something into a library, you can't ever call a board. Like, let me just state that right now. A library is not allowed to call a board, ever. That's a bad library. I never want to use, this is my game developer perspective. There are definitely low, very low level systems level libraries that might decide to do that. But in my opinion, a library should never call a board, ever. Um, because it's like, dude, you're a library. Like, why did you abort? Like, unless literally, like, I don't know under what conditions it would, I, I would find it acceptable for someone to abort. Never, never abort in a library. However, you do want to be able, from the library writer's point of view, you do want to be able to do the moral equivalent of an abort, which is abort my library. Like, abort this execution of the library because I don't want to deal with the fine-grained recovery and cleanup. And I don't want all my functions to have to... Um, propagate error codes if the only job of that is to ultimately abort at the top level. So you want to have a way of dealing with that. Now, the way I generally do that is twofold. Um, and this is going to tie into another thing that some people uh, were mentioning, which is, is really obvious, but I intentionally don't care about it in this version of the compiler because it's a batch mode compiler. It's not a library. Uh, it's just a standalone application, um, which is memory leaks. So right now, um, we don't ever free memory, right? Um, that's intentional. It's because in a few cases, like the temp buffers during um, parsing for the parameter list and so on, in that case, it's because we didn't have a way to use temp allocation with stretchy buffers. In other allocations, I put allocations into arenas, like AST nodes are all in arenas, but I never bother freeing the arena at the top because why would I? Um, once you do an actual library, and it's intended to be like a serious production quality library. You never want to leak memory. You always want to work with allocators provided by the client. And you want to have clean error recovery. The client doesn't care about how you do recovery. So he doesn't care about whether it's easy or hard for you to write the, uh, the easier, you know, he, like the client wants things to just be clean from his perspective. He wants to be able to pass in an allocator. And if there's an allocation failure, you can't abort. Like you definitely can't abort if there's an allocation failure. Um, and he doesn't want you to do anything of that sort. He wants you to clean up the memory as well. In some cases, maybe, in some cases, maybe, um, the custom allocator the client provides is the kind of allocator that doesn't require cleanup. In that case, the allocator's cleanup function can just be a no-op and so on. But you should be able to use the library with um, plugging in any allocator and having it do the right thing in terms of uh, freeing things. So you want to be able to handle all of this. The strategy we're going to take not just with a compiler but with a lot of libraries is that we're going to use coarse grained allocators like arenas, temp allocators, um, yeah, basically those those two types of allocators. Um, it may, maybe segregate a little bit further like for example the intern, uh, the lexer because you want the lexer to be standalone, the lexer has its own arena for uh, for the name table uh, and for the token list, the uh, the parse the AST references uh, a name table, uh, so but but it's not potentially owned by it; it's referenced, um, and then it has its own set of AST nodes in an arena. So it has its own AST arena, like we do currently. Um, the resolver would reference an AST, but it would not own it, and it would own and manage resolved nodes, which are like resolved expressions, resolved statements, resolved decals, and it would allocate those out of its own arena. 
Um, in addition, all of these would probably have temp allocators internally that are just used for doing work in order to do computation, but those would not really be part of their external inner, like those would go away after an operation is done. Whereas, you know, the arenas would basically persist. Um, what else? And yeah, and, and so on. So that's kind of the general strategy is you have some coarse grained allocators. Uh, they're, gener they're segregated into sort of two classes, broadly temporary and permanent. Um, the temporary ones disappear completely. So if you parse a file, all the temporary allocations go away when you return, but the, the permanent ones obviously don't because you want to be able to produce the AST and hand it back to the caller. So you segregate those up front, which not only helps with efficiency, but it means that it's easy to manage the lifetimes because you just have a few big arenas that uh, encapsulate all of the allocations. Uh, and it's also just much more efficient, but I think the important thing to understand, it's really about the lifetime management. You're coupling the lifetimes of different things by putting them into the same arena or the temp, same temp allocator. Um, so that's sort of the story for allocation. And then it's very easy to clean up because if I want to do the equivalent of AST free, I just free the AST arena, um, If I, you know, and so on. Um, same across the board. There's only a few things you have to free. Um, and if those are all linear buffers, the free is like literally a single operation. Uh, if they're static buffers, there is no operations. If they're AST arenas, you know, there's a few operations you have to iterate over the blocks and free those individually, but there's relatively few blocks. So overall, it's almost nothing in terms of actual runtime work. But importantly, not, it's not so much about the efficiency, it's about the convenience of managing things with these top level uh, objects that own everything, rather than having the functions do RAII style uh, enter exit cleanup, which is a mess. It, it's both inefficient and the code is nasty. Uh, when you do that. Um, so that's it on sort of on the memory management side. Now, what about um, recovery? How do you do recovery? And I think I mentioned it in earlier streams, but I never implemented it because I didn't see a need to because we can just use abort when we have this whole process compiler. But you want to be able to support code that's very similar to abort. Um, and the you don't want to use exceptions. C++ exceptions. Fortunately, C provides something called long jump set jump. And I'll explain how it works under the hood. Um, but that's what I've always used for this sort of recovery. And it basically lets you implement the equivalent of abort, but on a library, on a library level, like scope to a library rather than just aborting the whole application. So I'll show you, it's coupled to some other stuff that's somewhat orthogonal, but uh, let me show you some code for that right now. Um, I also have a story for resource cleanup, uh, which is coupled to this. Um, so d maybe don't worry too much about this. But what I want to say is th the way I'm thinking about this is that when I'm thinking about this as an operating system, when an operating si when I do operating system abort, like when I do uh, the, the actual operating system syscall is not called abort on Unix, but if when I do the equivalent of abort, the syscall that filters into the operating system and, and that kills the process is responsible for, you know, freeing the memory, freeing all the kernel objects and resources that are associated with me. So if I have any files open, if I have any sockets open, if I have any shared memory objects, like all of these different kernel objects that are associated with a process, when I do an abort, um, the the OS is responsible for cleaning it up, right? That's why abort is so great. It's not just a, it's a way, the OS does everything for us. Um, I want to have that solution for cleanup, um, but, but I can't abort at the OS level, obviously, because that will kill the whole application, not just the library. So here's my proposed way. Um, imagine, this is obviously a test case. Imagine that this is the top level parse function. So you call, you know, Imagine you're writing um, a parse, uh, I don't know, a parse package or a, something like that. So it's some top level entry point. Something like this. I want to basically be able to surround all of my code in a bracket like this, where I, I, I establish a recovery context and then here, of course, there's no recursive calls, but actually let me show this because if you've never seen long jump before, you, you, you won't believe this works, um, I'm sure. Test panic. Um,
So I'm, I'm creating this function, and this th you should imagine this mimics some very complex recursive library implementation like or parser or resolver or something like that. And so the intent here is just it's going to do ten, uh, a thousand recursive calls, and then it's going to panic when it finishes uh, the recursion. Uh, and so the point I want you to understand is that by the time it reaches the bottom of this call stack, it's going to have a massively deep call stack, okay? Um, and of course, I'm sure this is not going to work now because curse of the demo. Uh, let me put that here to illustrate the point. Actually, let me show the let me show the original case, which I know works. And then if it breaks, you, you've, you've seen it, and then we can debug it. Um, Um, what happened there? Because it, oh, that's pretty interesting. Let's take a break one here. Okay, that's really weird, huh? I mean, uh, of course this is intentional, but if you haven't seen it before, you might be slightly shocked. How did it jump there? That's not legal, is it? Um, anyway. This, this is long jump set jump um, based, but let me show you the even more striking example. Maybe let's not do a thousand off the bat. So look at the call stack here. We're, we're deep, right? We're 10 deep. And now I do this, and now we're out. So that's the idea. You register a recovery context at the top level entry point to a library. Um, and then you can panic deep in a call stack, and it will jump back up. Um, and so Typically, people use this just directly if you're low levels or into sort of C programmer, you would use this just with long jump and set jump, which are the functions that respectively establish a context and reinstate a context, basically. And a, and a long jump, a set jump context is just if, I mean, we've talked about risk five before, like, uh, I mean, I actually don't know what the assembly code looks like in this case because it's not inlined. Uh, well, we, we, can, we can check that out. No, I think it uses library functions, so we don't want to step through all of that. It's a little bit slower than it needs to be in MSVC's uh, CRT for that. But uh, the, the basic idea is, you know, the execution state as of this stack frame and includes, you know, all the registers, the program counter, the stack pointer, and so on. And in order to sort of jump back to this point, all you have to do is reinstate those register values. So there's no stack unwinding. This is why I say it's not exceptions. Exceptions is when you do frame by frame unwinding everything intermediate between your your location and the recovery um, trampoline or whatever you want to call it, the bottom point. Everything is going to get unwound and and, and there's some recovery code called, you know, like there's um, in C++ there's destructors being called, there's finally clauses being executed. If it's in C sharp, there's also uh, using uh, what do you call it? Like the dispose method on uh, on, on I dispose objects uh, that are registered with using. Those are going to be called. So that's why I say this is not exceptions because it doesn't do any frame by frame unwinding. It doesn't call any frame by frame recovery. It just jumps directly to the top. Um, that's why it's like an OS abort. When you do OS abort, it doesn't do any stack unwinding RAI recovery. It just says, oh, what are the resources that I need to clean up? And let's clean them up, right? That's what an OS does. It just has a registry of everything that it needs to clean up. Um, so that's how we do it. So let me show you the idea here. Um, these are just dummy uh, file APIs, but they work for any resource. In fact, you can implement this for any resource. This is just a normal file object. Eventually, you're going to be able to write to them and so on. But um, let's look at the API first. I open a file. By, by virtue of opening a file, I've done nothing. This is just a freestanding resource. You know, it's a file I can do with it. I can 
you know, pass it around. I don't have to worry about it being coupled to this uh, quote unquote process like this library. Um, it's just a call. But what I can do is I can secure it. And when I secure a resource, it becomes associated with um, a, a recovery, like a, a, I, I call it a disposables list. It's basically a stack of things that is uh, that, that has to be recovered from, um, uh, that has to be cleaned up. So it's like a list of files, a uh, list of sockets, list of, it could be memory buffers, but we don't use memory, we, we don't really do memory management with this approach. This is more for other things. Um, but you could do it with memory buffers if you wanted to. It's just not the primary use case. But the idea is that this is, you know, think like an OS. What are the resources that the, pro that the process owns? What are the resources that the library owns? You register those. Um, and then they get freed. So you don't know the implementation. But what I'm actually checking with this assert is that all the disposable resources are cleaned up. If you... Um, If you look at the disposables list at this point, I guess it's actually STD disposables. Um, if you look at it at this point, only the first one is filled in. But you can see, if you look at this object here, it has an associated function pointer. And, the, and for this case, it's file dispose. Um, let me try to register another file. Um, so now you can see we have another thing here. You can also see there's this mark in the stack. The mark in the stack is basically so they know their location in the recovery list. Um, because this this thing here is not, like, the, the disposables is a list of pointers. The pointers themselves are embedded in, like, the, this data here is part of the file object. So this is really a reverse pointer to their location in the list. Um, now what happens, and actually let me, show you what the code does. Now what happens when we step in here? It's very simple. We dispose of everything that's associated with the context, everything up to and including the context is what it does. Um, so let's look at what that does. It's extremely simple. It goes through the disposable stack and just does a function pointer call, closes it. By the way, all of these things were designed to have idempotent semantics so that you can double dispose them cleanly and stuff. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Like for example, if you manually close something somewhere and then it's also on the recovery list, you should not have to unsecure it first because that's obnoxious. So all of these things have to be idempotent. Um, yeah, so we, we do that for both files. And uh, you can see we don't, we don't clean up everything on the disposables list. We clean up everything up to and including the mark. And then we reset the disposables high point to the mark. And then we do the long jump. And that's what actually transfers control. But the point here is when you do the, all these different secures, and they don't have to happen in this uh, stack frame. They can happen deeper. Um, when this happens, um, Basically, like the way to think about it is that the context, when you do this recover, actually, let me show you the code. When you do this recovery, well, maybe I have an inline function here. I guess the problem is, oh, it's a macro, that's the problem. Um, but I can show you the macro. It has to be a macro because it uses set jump. I had a nasty bug with that. It's a stupid bug I've made like 10 times in my life, a few years apart. Um, set jump, right, right, right. But basically what this does is it actually makes, the context itself is a disposable object and it records where it was, it basically records the state. It records the mark for the current disposable stack by the time the recover is executed. And so what that means is it basically knows where this point is. And so any resources that are secured deeper than this will be recovered up to this point. But, but this works nested. So if you have a library that calls another library that has its own recovery context, um, that will just work. Like th those things will be associated only with their own libraries. There won't be any sort of interference there. Uh, 
if you have to be very careful with things like callbacks, but you, you should never do that, especially for code like this, um, where things transfer back and forth and maybe things can get associated with the wrong recovery context. But you shouldn't be writing that kind of code uh, for, for these sorts of robust libraries anyway. Um, but yeah, um, that's basically the idea. Um, I thought about making this more explicit, like you have to secure it relative to a specific context, and that may be how it ends up working. Right now, it's based on a shared thread local uh, stack, um, but that's the idea. Um, the emphasis on the files is, just to give you an example, uh, really the idea is you want to have a way of writing general purpose libraries without having to, because basically the motivation for this is previously when I've written libraries like this, I've done special case versions of this where, for example, if I have files to clean up or some other GPU resources to clean up or whatever it is, I will have a centralized list of each resource type and then I will just have ad hoc code to do the cleanup if I have to abort the library execution. In this way, there's a unified mechanism and it's integrated with the bit with panic. So it's basically just a way of saying, look, if we need this recover and panic thing just to do control transfer, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to couple it to some sort of general purpose solution for um, doing OS style res resource cleanup. But that's really the metaphor that's driving my thinking is that this is like OS style process cleanup and you want to be able to write code that looks like a board um, and behaves like a board in terms of cleaning up the process, but which is clean in terms of interop with other libraries. So there's still implementation details and design details to sort out. For example, maybe securing should always be explicitly targeting a context rather than just going on a stack. That's totally possible. Um, but um, it's already pretty nice to code with and the implementation is dead simple. Let me just show it to you in full. It's maybe a hundred lines of code. Um, so a disposable object has a dispose function and a mark, which is where it is in the stack, assuming it's a secured resource. Uh, when you make it disposable, it just you know puts that function pointer along with the current mark into a struct. Um, when you secure a resource, it adds it to the list if it's not already secured. If you unsecure a resource and it's secured, you remove it from the disposables list, you unlink it there so that, um, this is actually a really important use case that is sometimes annoying to heal, de deal with other approaches. Um, and it doesn't really have a good equivalent in the OS world. I guess it would be reference counting because kernel objects are always reference counted. But basically, um, the use case, let, let me comment this code out. Oh, let me show you something else. Um, even if you don't abort, this is a very convenient way of doing the cleanup in a unified way. So, oops. Um, sorry. This is not just for exceptional recovery. This is for normal recovery. You can just call explicitly dispose on the context um, and that will do the job. Um, so when you're when you're done and you exit on the normal path, you can do explicit disposal and this will, this basically prevents you from having to manually close files and stuff. And so that's why I said, even though this is intended to handle the hard case where you have a whole library with a deep call stack and you want to do recovery of both the control flow and of all the resources, this actually also, I think, with a bit of refinement, will work really well for even the equivalent of f and f close. I think you probably don't need to do anything like defer if you have this, because you can just basically open things, secure them. So this will be the equivalent of defer. Uh, and then every once in a while, like at the end of the function, you could do dispose. And actually, let me show you something else you can do. You can do um, assume, let me put this in a parallel kind of scope. Um, you can totally use this without a context. The context is just if you want to do panic. Um, if you do this, then you can do dispose file one because it's a disposable object. Um, when you do this, you can see things have been nulled out. Um, so the point is because of like uh, any, any disposable object serves as a mark in the disposable stack. So if you have 10 files that are open here, you just have to have one of you just have to have one dispose call which corresponds to the first one, um, and it takes care of everything. 
uh, frame level allocation. Did I cover frame level allocation earlier? No, I didn't. Uh, that's something that's less useful in a parser library, but I will talk about it later. But it may, yeah, let me let me talk about it right now. Frame allocation is exactly like permanent and temporary allocation, except that rather than with temp allocation, you're doing these more fine-grained nested uh, begin end markers uh, in order to reset the pointer. With frame level allocation, you intentionally only reset once per period. I usually call it a cyclic or periodic allocator because it's a concept that's not just useful for games. It's used in, uh, for example, if you look at um, Next Step uh, and its modern variants like Coco um, in uh, iOS and macOS, the way they do um, a lot of memory management. So they have, you know, they have uh, reference counting. And even they have arc, which is sort of an additional thing, uh, I guess, for semi-static uh, reference counting. But um, Objective-C has this concept called auto-release pools. And the idea behind auto-release pools is that if I'm trying to return an object to my caller, that like gets the result, I want to return to them as a result of the call. Um, but I don't want to force them to clean it up. And in fact, I also want them to be able to pass it to their caller without uh, having to do anything special. Uh, the way you do that in Objective-C is you actually you, you, you put the object you want to return in what's called the auto release pool, and then you, you release your reference. And by releasing the reference, it means the object's reference count has actually gone to zero. But because it's in the auto release pool, um, I, think, I think you have to decrement it to zero and then put it. But anyway, maybe I'm, I'm not object of C programmer, so I'm sort of, but, but the idea is basically, you have some kind of top level, event loop level, main loop level cleanup, and one nice thing about that is not only allocation efficiency, but it's the fact that you can push stuff up to the call chain without worrying about lifetime. So by having a main loop level um, allocator that only gets reset once a frame, or in the in the case of Objective C and the way they use it in Coco and Next Step originally, uh, once per event, it means that you can have a call chain and you can pass objects up the stack, and and they will be alive on the entire way back. Uh, and also for, you know, if, if someone, if a caller returns it to someone and then, then, then they call another function, they can pass that pointer to another function uh, and the stack will regrow. And so uh, that will all work because it points to memory that is only reset once a frame or once per event in the case of uh, Coco. So that's the idea of a, what I usually call a cyclic allocator or a periodic allocator, but in games, you, people usually call it a frame allocator. Um, it's useful both for efficiency um, another nice thing you can do in modern games that are multi-threaded is you can have you can multi you can multi-buffer your uh, frame allocator so that rather than having one allocated uh, one allocated buffer that's used for those frame allocations you have three and they work like a swap chain where um, when you're done with one you hand it to a thread that's working in a pipeline fashion and then when that thread is done with it, it it's like in a queuing fashion it says I'm done with it and then it also serves as an implicit synchronization thing where uh, you, you, you make that sort of pseudo swap chain as long as you want for decoupling. Uh, and, and if you ever wrap around and try to get the new frame allocator for the next frame before, the say, the renderer has finished with it, then there will be a synchronization point and you will prevent yourself from kind of overtaking the renderer by more than two or three frames or however long the chain is. So anyway, that's um, I'll talk about that maybe when we do some game stuff or game-like stuff later. Uh, it's less useful in some other contexts. Uh, but it does have its uses. But that's, from an implementation perspective, there's nothing to it. That's really more of a use case than a allocation a allocator type. Uh, you would use the same allocator type. You would just not reset it more than once per frame, basically, is the idea. But uh, it's worth having strong conventions around that stuff, uh, even if it's technically very simple. Anyway, but yeah, I wanted to point out, for people who don't know, this concept is not really specific to games. It actually exists... In terms of the lifetime management, it exists in the form of auto-release pools. And I think this shows that the main value of this is actually not so much just the efficiency of having a single buffer that gets recessed once per frame. It's also the lifetime management, the fact that during the course of a frame, I can have a stable pointer that I can pass around everywhere, and I don't have to worry about cleanup for it. It's handled uniformly at the frame level. But, uh, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, so uh, happy to say a few things about that. But... Uh, Technically, there's nothing to it. Uh, it's the same thing we showed before. It's just a use case for that. Um, all right, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, panic. Now I totally forgot. Oh yeah, let's, let's look at this code. I think we already tested it, but yeah. So when you secure your resources, when you do a dispose on a disposable object, it cleans everything up to and including that resource. So what that means is 
if you have 10 open files here, you can have a single dispose, and that's fine. Um, so you don't have to do fine-grained fclose type stuff if you don't want to. Uh, and I'm going to explore the I'm going to explore this style of programming more and see what the pros and cons are. Figure out maybe whether we need to do this with explicit contexts or the stack style is uh, appropriate. Um, the nice thing about the explicit passing is it works actually with callbacks and other weird uh, interlibrary transfer patterns. So maybe that's the way to go. And maybe that should be an optional usage pattern. Maybe it should be a mandatory usage pattern. I'm not sure. But um, anyway. But, but the point is that this works even for the non-recovery case where you're just trying to have a unified way of disposing stuff without worrying about um, disposing each thing individually. So I think that that could be nice even for function level recovery, never mind non-local recovery. God, I think we've already gone an hour and a half. Let me see what the time is. Two hours. All right. Um, let's actually start writing the lecture. Uh, I do think this stuff is worth covering. I think it's very much in the vein of, of, of what we're doing generally with Bitwise. So uh, I wanted to cover it, but um, I also want to actually start writing the goddamn lexer. So let's start doing that. Um, all right. So let's just look at the code and get a sense. Actually, let, let me take um, let me take a swig of. of a beverage and read the chat if there's any questions and answer questions and then we will you know be before diving into the lecture which will probably be the next hour at least um, depending on my energy levels so let me just see what people are saying in chat um, you're asking how I'm dealing with overflow uh, I mean, the answer is it's not going to deal with it, basically. It's it's going to be like C, unfortunately. Um, my preference would be, I don't like, I, 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 I seriously hate signed integer overflow semantics in C. On the other hand, unsigned overflow is in many ways equally bad because even though it doesn't trigger unsigned, uh, it doesn't trigger undefined behavior, It, it in terms of the language spec, um, it triggers undefined behavior in the application in the sense that things you're expecting to be, you, you added a number to something, you expected it to grow, to be strictly bigger than the thing you started with, now it's actually less than because of wraparound. So uh, that said, I think that even, even given that that's the case, that I think sometimes people overstate the issue around signed integer overflow in the sense that um, unsigned integer overflow also leads to undefined behavior, just typically, or not undefined, but it leads to like random behavior. It leads to hard to predict behavior in applications, uh, regardless of whether uh, it gives the compiler license to screw with your code, uh, which is people's concern typically with uh, signed integer overflow and unsigned, uh, undefined, undefined behavior. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that the license with which compilers exploit the aforementioned is a problem. Um, but as long as we're targeting C as a first class backend, as opposed to just uh, uh, like a second or third class backend, I think we have to sort of constrain ourselves by what is broadly, uh, well, but both what is guaranteed by the standard, but but also even beyond that, um, what what compilers do in practice, uh, and, and also what trend they're heading in, because undefined behavior has become, regardless, of, it's been in the standard for a long time. A lot of the cases that people complain about, including myself, have been in the standard forever, but just no compilers until in the last 10 years really started uh, using it very heavily. But this does constrain us with regard to what we can expect in terms of generic C code uh, behaving. Um, so yeah, probably some kind of wrapper if you want to get well-defined semantics for the sign case. I haven't thought as much about that. It's possible we will just allow you to compile your code with integer, signed integer arithmetic, having defined semantics. Unfortunately, this means that now I have to translate all your pretty plus and so on to wrapper functions, um, which I guess is what you were suggesting, uh, you in the chat. Um, so we will probably have a mode like that. But on the other hand, I want to be able to generate idiomatic C code. And that definitely goes against that. So that would basically be a way of deploying hardened libraries more so than the standard way of distributing libraries, I would say. Um, 
like if, if you need it, basically you would do that. But uh, otherwise, it would be like an option, like an ultra safe option, um, but not just the not, not not the semantics because the semantics. I don't want to force this to be the semantics because it would force the C code I generate to to be awful looking. Um, anyway, I realize that's maybe controversial if you're coming from a security background, uh, and I appreciate that. But you know, I'm, I'm for, for me this is like a hacker's system language basically, and I like that kind of language. Um, let's see. Uh, do I have any interest in non-transpiling backend if you plan on using Ion for x86 as well? I may have. I just don't want to even think about it because, I mean, I think you guys who, who follow me know that I have plenty of experience writing native backends for x64. Like that's, it's not really hard to do a decent job. The problem is just the long tail of stuff. You like, basically here are my choices, right? I can use LVM, which is probably the easiest way nowadays to just get fairly turnkey support. Uh, it moves most of the annoying stuff off my plate, especially nowadays that LVM on Windows has gotten a lot better in terms of can, you know, ability to generate PDBs and stuff that I consider essential. That's becoming more and more of a turnkey option for Windows as well. That's great. Um, I would consider doing a backend for LVM in, in, in the future, maybe, and then maybe people can do it for them once we have the new, hopefully beautiful compiler API where you can easily plug in backends and stuff. So uh, maybe, but the problem with using LVM is it's not actually going to speed things up very much. Um, and I still want to have the C backend as a first class customer. That's I never want that to become sort of second fiddle because one of the main use cases is to be able to distribute C libraries to C programmers. Um, like SC code, I believe pretty strongly in that. Um, and if I generate tight C code, the compile time difference between using a fast C compiler versus LVM is basically zero. Like it's a very marginal difference. It's not 10x, 20x, 100x, or anything like that. So in order to get 10, 20, 100x, 1000x, I don't know, like in order to get like a huge, huge uh, boost, I basically need to either write something myself or use something with similar performance characteristics. The problem with both of them is that none of them do what I want. Like I, I want to get PDBs, uh, I want to get all, I want to have static TLS, right? Like some of that stuff is mostly linker based, but the problem is the linker is often the bottleneck. Um, and so you probably have to write your own linker. Like it's just, there's so much work once you open that Pandora's box and the delta between generating C and using a fast C compiler versus generating or just using LVM directly is so small that that, I think that doesn't make sense. The only case that might make sense is having a subset of the language. That's why I don't like it. You would basically like, how are you going to support TLS? Like there's all kinds of stuff that's really annoying to deal with. Um, it's possible there are some cases you could make work. Um, but I don't want to think too hard about it right now. Um, what I'm more likely to do, actually, is a scripting mode, for lack of a better word. Like, I don't know. I might do a slightly altered semantics that can actually work. That's more like a scripting language semantics for the for a subset of the language or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's a big question, but I'm not seriously thinking about that right now. In the distant future, maybe, but I feel like the delta between where we are now and where I would want that to be in terms of performance would be at least 100x. And to get that, there's nothing that exists um, that does that and which also does all the other things I want. Like, it's not acceptable for me to not have full debuggability, TLS support, um, unwind info, everything, right? Like you need everything for it to be usable, uh, pretty much. And that's a, a huge mouthful. So, uh, for us, I think that's not the right move, but, uh, maybe I will change my mind. All right. Someone's asking about uh, how safe is set jump, long jump. Um, Uh, generations of C programmers hate libpng for use of long jump because of its interaction with exceptions. Don't know the details. So long jump doesn't interact with exceptions. Um, 
except on Windows, from what I know. Windows Long Jump has a weird thing where it invokes both SEH and S C++ in exceptions using, you know, uh, Win64 unwind info and stuff like that, or I guess even Win32 unwind info, whatever the equivalent was in those days. Um, however, that should not be an issue if you don't cross callback uh, stacks. Like, I can imagine this being an issue if you have to recover, like if, if you, you call the library, the library calls you, you call the library and then I, I recover, that would do a jump across your stack frame. And so if you have C++ RAI or exceptions or something like that, that's going to screw with that. Um, so don't do that. Like basically don't call into foreign code if you want that kind of cleanup. It seems really reasonable to me. Um, I should look at the libpng case. I've used this in published products. I know Sean used this in Iggy. It's just the standard way systems programmers do this kind of process style recovery. Um, the, you have to be careful about the API. Like I said, if you intermingle slices of call stack from, from your code and other people's code, um, then it can become problematic if you expect, if, if other people expect, say, exceptions or destructors to get called. But that's a really good argument against uh, calling like against le even allowing that use case, uh, at least if you, for, for general purpose code. At the very at the very most, you shouldn't require callbacks for anything like that. Maybe if there's a, you know, maybe if you want to write a compiler plugin, you have to do it that way, and then you can't use C++ or something like that. But for just interacting with a library, I should not have to write a callback. That's one of the problems. Or at least not if, if I want to use this style. So you can look at it from either direction as a constraint on the client or on the library developer. But it's not hard to make the choice uh, or the trade-off um, in, in any given case, I think. And in most cases, you should avoid the problem from occurring in the first place by just not having this kind of callback scenario that would pro provoke it. So I don't know what libpng use case, API use case, would cause that to manifest. Um, but maybe I'll look into it just to make sure that um, there's not some weird thing I'm uh, not clued in about, but uh, I've used this in published products uh, that are shipped on many different platforms to many different people, and uh, it's not a problem, at least if you do it the way I normally do it, which is not callback based. All right. Um, so yeah, so so safe about set jump, long jump for threads. Uh, are there issues with threads? Yes, there are issues with, with threads. Um, if you if you if you long jump between threads, things are going to go very badly. Uh, yeah, don't do that. Um, you can you can you can handle that case by tagging things with thread IDs as a sanity check. Um, I should also mention everything is done with TLS right now. I didn't mention that. I put in TLS. Um, so the disposable stack is thread local. And the temp object we use for, um, this is just in order to do, be able to do the macro this way. But stuff like this is also thread local. Um, so everything that should be thread local is thread local. So this works with threads in that sense. You just don't want to set jump from one thread and long jump from another thread. Don't do that. But um, yeah, again, this doesn't occur unless you have a weird callback case where the set jump occurs on one thread, then the library does a callback to something that ends up calling another, I don't even know how, and that hands the context to another thread. Anyway, uh, that's one case with threads I've never seen even remotely show up in practice. But yeah, you, you, can, you can catch it as a sanity check using uh, tagged contexts that, that have a thread idea as the tag. Um, and I think the OS will probably actually do that now that I think about it. I'm sure that it records the thread ID in the context it uh, captures. All right, one last swig and then let's do the lexer. Um, yeah, so let's let's uh, let's look through the code, and I've already thought about some of this, but also most of jock my own memory. Um, and, and, and you guys is let's uh, let's look at this code. Some of this, uh, like there's a lot of, like especially this stuff is going to change drastically. I already have a better way, for example, of doing this without macros. Way better. Um, 
So, so yeah, so, so let's think about what we want to do here. And let me talk about some of the things that I got lazy about more recently as I realized the compiler was going to go away, the old one was. Um, one of the main reasons for kind of registering certain kinds of interned names up here, one is for the keywords. Um, there's a specific trick where uh, we ensure that the keywords are sequentially allocated um, by the underlying uh, allocator. We probably can't assume that anymore, so we have to do it a little bit differently. Um, for that, uh, by just, for example, tagging their entry in the table rather than just using a simple interning uh, approach. But um, yeah, so that's one reason is that um, you can you can check whether a, fun, a, a chart pointer corresponds to a keyword by just doing a, an interval check between these two. So that's one reason we do it this way. Then we also have other names that are just kind of cached, um, just so you can refer to them without repeatedly re-entering them in code. This is the part I got really lazy about later because um, in some cases, like for the intrinsics, I had so many new names and, um, you know, I didn't want to deal with it basically, uh, recognizing those intrinsics by name. And so what I ended up doing was I would just do, and you saw that before if you're paying attention, I would just do this in some code, generally code that wasn't on the critical path, like stuff that would only get called once you're dealing with an intrinsic, for example. So there's not that many intrinsics in the code it's not the end of the world, and of course this code is going away. But in general, I think what we do want is you want to be able to have a centralized name repository where all these standardized names that you want to refer to from the compiler code or the lexer code are registered. Um, and so for example, the kind of thing I have in mind would be um, for the keywords maybe, keyword ID. Keyword none, keyword um, break, keyword continue. Um, and then the way I plan to do it now is um, basically, of course, there, there, there needs to be sort of the quote unquote prototypes of the names, like the, 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 the shared string literals in the executable. Um, but then you also need to have the intern versions that exist in each library instance, and those need to be private to that library because they they need to be owned by it. Uh, probably they need to be owned by it. Do they? Maybe they don't. Let me think about that. No, let's let's say they're owned by the library. Um, so then you would do something like this. Um, You know, something like that. Um, and so that's just, a, so we're just going to go through the whole file and talk about the kind of the, the idioms and how I want to improve them or translate them in the case where there's no strict counterpart of what we were doing before. So this is how I plan to do that. And then when, when you do the, you know, the, the keywords in it, it will be like, Um, Something like that. Something like that. So 
now, uh, by the way, we're going to stop using global variables uh, for, because it's a library. I'm, I've actually, I'm, for a while, I was thinking about there's actually a lot of stuff you can do with thread local storage in order to mimic the local variable approach. Because I was thinking more and more about like, you know, I'm, I'm using this kind of process metaphor that I also used for the um, the panic and recover stuff. And I was thinking, maybe we think of, anyway, I was going a little too far I carried away and I was thinking like, okay, we can actually use global variables, but it's TLS. The problem with TLS is even though it's basically free, as long as it's static, um, like it's very cheap. To, in case you guys don't know, TLS is, TLS is just, the code looks like this at x86 on Windows. And, and uh, it basically, what is it, FS, uh, off um, something like this. Um, I think it's something like this. Um, we're basically there's a static offset relative to a segment register, which is where all the thread split local stuff is stored, like also the, what is it, the TEB and the TIB and all that stuff. There's a static offset where things are pre-allocated. Then there's a dynamic index, which is used for dynamic linking. So normally this would be zero if it's only the main application, um, but, but this is here in order to support uh, dynamic linking. And so um, this means you can have, a, this is basically like relocation, dynamic relocation, where the relocation is provided by this global variable. And so when you link an external DLL, you can, the loader linker can override TLS index, the version of TLS index in that app, in that image with its offset in the global shared block. That's the idea. Um, so this is basically TLS. So it's basically no more expensive than a global variable load. Um, but uh, the problem with TLS is that every time, a th let me say a little bit more about TLS because this is a low level thing that's appropriate for Bitwise. Normally when you have a binary on disk, you know, you have BSS and, uh, and data segments containing uh, general static data and, um, and zero initialized data. And sometimes you also have RO data, which is used for read only data. Um, when you have TLS, thread local storage, in addition, you get a TLS segment and this is essentially like a data segment um, in the sense that it contains the initial values of anything that's a marked uh, thread local. And then the way it works is the way to think about it is uh, data BSS and RO data are used when you create a, a, an instance of a certain binary image in a, in a process. TLS is the same except that it's per thread. So every time a thread is allocated, they get a copy of whatever data is in TLS. So this is how you get uh, statically initialized TLS propagated into every new thread. Um, the the gotcha is that when you have multiple dynamic uh, libraries linked together, um, the TLS becomes essentially the concatenation of every, you know, of, of all the blocks, and then you need those offsets in order to deal with the offsets. But ignoring DLLs, basically, uh, the point is every thread makes a copy of the TLS block per thread into its third local block. And uh, the downside of that is if you only have a relatively small amount of TLS, uh, that's not a problem. Uh, if you start using it everywhere, you're kind of adding more and more storage costs per thread. At a certain point, it doesn't matter. If, if you're only adding a few hundred bytes total across an entire application per thread, it's not gonna matter. Um, if, if that would matter, then you have bigger problems. You have too many threads. Um, but there can definitely come a point where if your general approach to doing pseudo global state for libraries is um, is TLS, then you have a problem. So I, I thought about it, but I was like, nah, that's a little too crazy even for me. So we're not going to do that. But uh, that's why that's one of the kind of practical reasons you wouldn't want to do TLS. The other one is it doesn't really help with reentrancy. Uh, if you do need to do reentrancy, then you at least have to be careful. You, have, you need to have a stack of the TLS. I mean, you can make it work, but um, anyway. So one thing that is going to change is that, yeah, we're passing around an explicit object that encapsulates everything to do with different kinds of modules. So in this case, the lecture object is going to have a keywords table. It will also have the data structure for the actual interning. Uh, but anyway, this is just the kind of thing that, uh, that this will translate to. 
So all of this code here will basically turn into this. So there will be a, a string loadable table here, and then these will get interned. Um, it's possible now that I think about it, we actually don't need to do this. Um, if we do, let me think. Can I lay, is there a C trick I can use to make sure that all the string data is consecutive so we can test for, we can do the pointer checks against those. Um, no, we can't. Because when you have a multi-dimensional array in C, the innermost dimensions have to have the same size so that they're static stride. Um, I guess that's not totally true. One thing you could know, I don't think you can do that, unfortunately. Yeah, okay, let's just get, take this approach, whether the prototypes of the keywords are here and then we intern them locally for, for ease of working with them. Maybe I'll think of a better way to do it. But uh, but anyway, that, that's the replacement for the kind of code we have here. Um, then what I want to do for um, for names that are not really keywords. So basically, the lexer will have this keyword stuff. The rest of the compiler, this stuff here will not be in the lexer. This is just here because it was a convenient place to stow it. But this sort of stuff here where you just want to cache the intern names is going to be a separate thing which will be in the uh, parser, I guess. No, because let me think. The parser should only need to know about keywords, not names. So probably this will be in the resolver, some, uh, some other upstage point. Um, and so what you want to do for this is um, for names, you're just going to have uh, I'm not even going to use prefixes for uh, to keep them short. So you will just have stuff like, I guess in our case, it would be always foreign, inline, no inline, uh, complete, uh, assert, intrinsic, you know, all these different things. And then similarly, we will do, we will do this sort of thing. I mean, I'm not going to write it out again, but you know what I mean. Same, same, same kind of thing. Um, but this will not be in the lexer. It doesn't belong in the lexer. The keywords have actual general meaning with regard to the lexer. The lexer needs to, uh, well, the, actually, the lexer doesn't need to know, but the parser needs to know. So the lexer needs to present that information about which things are keywords and which are not. It needs to present that in a convenient way to the, um, to the parser. Whereas this stuff is more upstream stuff. This does not affect any decision making in the parser. And keeping it separate is kind of sending, aside from just cleanliness, it's also sending the right signal that this is not something that actually affects parsing. This is semantic names, names that are interpreted by the resolver and other upstream stuff in a certain way has no meaning in the parser. So um, those things will be partitioned in the new design. Um, so yeah, we need to think about whether we can guarantee this in an easy way with a new allocation scheme. I think we definitely can. All we have to do is um, use an arena allocator with an initial block size that is large enough to contain all the string data and associated data structures. And that's easy to do. We can just have a conservative estimate for that, um, for that initial block size. So we can do the same thing in our new compiler. For token IDs, um, I'm actually going to, so let me say a few things about identifier naming in general. I'm going to start using much more abbreviated names for a lot of this stuff. I was starting to notice, so first of all, this is partly just a reevaluate. Oh, I just got disconnected, so let me wait for OBS to reconnect. We reconnected. No, we're not. Oh, 
All right, reconnection successful. It's got a connection drop. Gotta love Thailand internet. Um, what I was, I don't know how much got truncated before the connection dropped. What I was going to say, and this is kind of a, a good example of it, is I'm going to start trying to, since we have packages um, to help with global name conflicts, I'm going to, while consistency for certain prefixes is nice and stuff, I'm going to try start to compress names further because I was noticing in the code that code was getting too long in terms of the amount of stuff on a line and it was becoming harder and harder for me to read the code because the names were too long. I don't think I talked much about my, <laughs> my ideology around naming, but I very firmly believe based on experience that for code to be readable, you, it needs to be compact on the page because otherwise it's impossible to see what's actually going on. You can only see the names and the names are a distraction when you're trying to read code. Um, they're only, they're useful sometimes in APIs, but they're not useful when you're reading code because when you're reading code, you don't need to see what the description is. You need to see what the meaning of the code is. And I think it was already getting to be a problem. If you look at some of the resolver, some of this stuff here is too descriptive, I think. So we need to find better idioms for some of these things in some cases by compressing names um, and so on. Um, some of this stuff is way too verbose, uh, purely because of the names. Um, in other cases, just because maybe stuff should be factored into functions. So a, a combination of, of, of approaches will be used to compress names and, and other things. Um, but what I wanted to say is for things that are really like, um, like this thing here, I think it's way nicer to just have this for the name because it's the name. So it's kind of obvious that it stands for itself in some sense. So for some cases like this, I will try to compress the names. In other cases, I will probably start using more, more, more truncated versions of names, like maybe token instead of token, or I don't know, but like maybe not so much, this is not really a big problem case. But for stuff like this, uh, I'm going to probably start being even more aggressive with abbreviation. Um, but yeah, a lot of this table-driven stuff will probably broadly transfer over as is. Um, this is mostly fine, I think. Tables are good. It would be nice to automate some of this, but you can't really in the general case. I think you recall when we did the very first version of the Lexer, we used eponymous token uh, tags where a single character token stood for themselves. But I kind of don't like how that creates this random heterogeneity in how you write a token. Um, so we moved to this unified representation. But I think actually these names are a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Um, this, is, <clears throat> this is pure noise. This should just be EOF, maybe not so much. Uh, be, well, actually, it can be because we have we don't have to worry about the global EOF system because we have you know, some namespacing. These should just be called L parent, R parent, L brace, R brace. Clearly, like when I look at it now through the lens of things I've been thinking about recently, clearly these should just be called this. Um, they add no information. Of course, these are tokens when you're in the token when you're in the lexer, right? Uh, if you're outside of the lexer then it will look, you know, it will look like this, right? Like if, if Lexer is the, so you have ion.lexer as the module, as a package. So suppose you do something like this. Um, you know, it might look like this if you're like a library user and you want to use the prefix. So the point is that there's no name collisions because we have namespacing, and these are the primary product of the lexer in some sense. Maybe they will even be in a separate ion.tokens, um, but in which case it would be like ion tokens, EOF. And so you do. I don't know, but the, but the point is that the base names I'm going to make shorter. In many cases, I will still retain a prefix that's consistent with the name of the type. Uh, in other cases like this, uh, I think foregrounding certain things as being the primary subject of 
computation uh, and, and privileging them in terms of having no prefixes is a good idea. So that's what I'm going to start doing for a lot of things is kind of thinking critically about um, does it make sense to make these more compact in this context because it's so ugly to see this being written out everywhere. It makes the code code lines twice as long and just hides the, the real symbolic structure of the code. So stuff like that is going to change in the new version, but, uh, but broadly speaking, this kind of thing is going to be the same. Statically initialized tables for some of these mappings. Um, some of this stuff is not actually a Lexer feature. So, so this is not something that has to do with the Lexer if you think about it, right? This is not a feature of the Lexer. This is just a convenience mapping that we put here because I guess it felt right, but this is really something that you want in the back end, I think. Um, I wonder who uses this right now. It's probably Jen, right? That's all. Yes, and this is not even a canonical thing. This is just a shortcut in order to share some code between two different parts for the uh, assignment and binary operator versions. Um, uh, sorry, just turning on the fan here. Um, of an operator. So stuff like this will not be in the module. Source position. Okay. That's definitely something we will change our general representation of. Um, right now, the way we do source positions is they're just scattered everywhere when you need to store them. One nice thing you can do, um, which is pretty commonly done in, in various versions, but um, is what you do is um, And, and we, I think we will do this in the new Lexer un, unless I change my mind. Um, what you will do is you will have a abstract. Um, you will you will have an abstract source position tag which cannot be interpreted raw. Like you have to go through a lookup of or 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 something, and that's the thing that goes in uh, AST nodes when they want to say I, I'm I'm from here or whatever. Um, and what that will reference is implicitly it will reference a token. And then the tokens themselves will have source information. Um, and so what, what you will have, for example, here's one implementation. Maybe this is not what we'll do. I'll, let me talk about a few variant implementations afterwards. But for example, suppose that when we lex, we accumulate a list of tokens in the entire, not just in the file, but period. So if we lex 10,000 files, we will have tokens for 10,000 files. So we will just have a global buffer of tokens. It's just a bigger dynamic array, and every time we put uh, we we tokenize something, we put it in there. Um, and so that's one implementation: is to have a unified list of tokens, and those internally, each token stores line information or whatever. Maybe not actually. There's uh, ways, for example, for the file. One thing you can do is you don't want to all the tokens in a row are going to have the same file, so you want to store the file name once. And then maybe each token stores its byte offset from the beginning of the file. So there's various ways you can organize that list. So it's segregated by file name. Um, and then when uh, if someone references a, a token by an index in that list, uh, you have to do two things. You have to first find what file you're in. And you can do that by doing a binary search on a separate list of, uh, of files. Like So you have, this to be very concrete here, um, suppose you have uh, a list of things, like we can even use tuples for this. So um, it would be, well, maybe we want to have something named. But basically, we have, uh, we have all the tokens, which is just a list of tokens. And then we have on the side, we have a list of files. Um, And each source file, uh, each, uh, source file is um, a 
So a token ID is just going to be an index into this list. And let's say we know we don't have more than 4 billion tokens. It seems like a reasonable assumption. So a source file will basically have an index of where the corresponding tokens start in, in the global token list. Uh, and it will also have, um, you know, like a path and any other metadata. And so then if I want to find out, um, um, this is just an index into the list. Um, yeah, let's not say that's the same thing. So let's say that's, that's it here. Um, so, so let's say now the, 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 the data type that's equivalent of our current post in terms of the tag, rather than storing inline all this information, what we will actually store is just this tag. And then uh, you can do stuff like this, um, for example. Um, Well, let's do the linear search version. And maybe this won't actually be in the Lexer, but in some kind of, I guess Clan calls it the source manager, but it might be in a separate object actually, but um, let's not even assume it's in a, let's just treat it like a global variable since it's besides the point. Um, and so what do you then do? Like this would be the linear search version, but basically um, if post is greater than, so let's see if, so you, you set, uh, if post is greater than or equal to file start, then Return file. Let's return null. Um, Um, the source file will also have um, um, so for finding the line uh, the kind of stuff we will do is um, once we know what file we're in, we're going to, and this will be the linear search version. You, you, will, you would do this with binary search, but I don't want to write binary search because it's totally besides the point right now. But it's obviously easy to do that. Um, but basically what you do is you iterate over, um, it's, this, it's the same exact thing. You iterate over um, These, and I should mention, these are the start of, or the end of every line, I guess. Um, let me think about it. No, it's the, yeah, it's the end of every line. Let's, let's say that that's the case. Um, So, um,
um, you get the token, and the token has. Let's just put it down here. The token has an offset, which is just the byte offset in the file where it starts. And it, actually, I'll call that start. And so let's see. Um, So you look up the token and you get its start. And then you search through all the lines and you find the first line where this is the case. And then you say, well, it's actually not a bad idea to return one base lines because then we can use zero as meaning a sentinel value for, for no nothing found. So let's do something like that. Um, and uh, column. Let's see, for column search, you basically have to do the same thing. Um, but then once you find the line, um, Then you return um, start minus base. Something like that. Um, so, so that's kind of going to be the idea. Assuming we had a centralized tokens list um, because we may actually not even need that. So let me talk about that as well. This is a fine implementation. Um, it requires storing a centralized list of tokens. That is useful broadly. Um, you may not want to force this to be the only way to access the tokenizer, like you can always call get token or next token, just uh, pumping it sort of, uh, you know, in a pipeline way, for example, like the way the parser does it. But if you want the list of tokens, it's certainly nice that you can get it this way. Uh, and this th this approach we stored here lets you have this compact index into a single tokens list from which we can very efficiently, uh, uh, well, if we did binary search, it would be very efficient. We could get all this other source data by simple searches. Um, and the point as well is that how often do you actually need to know the file and the line number uh, and, the, and, the, and the column? Not very often. Um, like it's usually when there's errors and stuff like that. Um, so it's kind of, you know, using some some nice uh, representations in order to get a compact representation for a lot of stuff. So this means that we can actually effectively get all the source info from a single UN32 that we can store. And, and these are going to go everywhere, right? Like these, sorry, these pose things are going to go everywhere. And so it's important that, um, that they're compact and uh, this lets us get everything. Uh, in fact, we can, I think we can get more than we used to because previously we just had the file name and stuff, but we didn't have any other metadata about the file. Like maybe there's some metadata here beyond just uh, the name, right? Well, you can see, in fact, the line starts, for example. Um, now, you can actually go further um, if you wanted to. The token struct itself is a little bit big. If you think about what we're doing here, actually all we need to do is we just need the, the token start. That's all we used for this. Um, what you can do is you can, in your tokens list, if you want to, you can just store the start, which is a uint32. Um, you can just store the start. And then you can just parse, you can tokenize on demand the token. So even if you want to get other aspects of the token for whatever reason, if you set up your tokenizer so that it's idempotent, you can you can just write a function that's like, you know, get get token at post, like, do, do, I, I think you see what I mean, right? You you could uh, assuming you set the tokenizer up right, and this is a rare operation where you, there, you don't have like for example maybe your core compiler doesn't need to reference tokens 
uh, persistently in this way, um, this would be a way where given essentially just a UN32 instead of this, um, and um, just this array of, of, of these kind of intervals of, of, of what which of these correspond to which files, uh, you could recreate the tokens on demand. Now we're probably going to start with a representation where we have a list of the tokens, maybe, I don't know, but um, this thing is very easy to write. This might be a fun thing to write once we've ported the Lexer, um, because it's a good test. If your Lexer can't easily do this kind of thing idempotently, then you have a design issue. So that will be a nice test of whether we did it right. But that's kind of what I'm thinking in terms of some of these things that are changing. Sorry, that was a big side topic, but um, let's talk about that. OK, let's get to the token itself. And also, let me see if people are asking questions. All right. Um, so for the new token struct, so what's going to change? Well, first off, we're not going to store this, the source position in here. We're going to store the offset like I just described. Um, we're not going to store the start and end pointers either. Um, we're just going to, we can, we can get those if you want, um, by going back to the source file itself, given like, let's see here, like basically by calling this and then from, you know, think of it this way. Suppose this is just the byte offset. So this would be a case of you just kind of grab it directly. Um, in order to get the end, if you don't store it explicitly, um, There's different ways you can do it. One way is to just literally use the tokenizer in the same way that when we call post token, we use the tokenizer in order to rescan it and we find out how long it was when we scanned it. You can't actually use the location of the next token. You might think that you could look at somehow, if you could correlate this with the original token stream, you could find the position of the next token. That's actually not true. Um, actually, I think this should not be a feature of, this should be a feature of posts. Um, so this would be like Actually, I guess it would just be directly, well, Um, because it really would just be be 
this kind of code. Um, all right, and then for the end, essentially what you would have to do is you would have to um, you would have to get the token, and when you have the token. Probably this should store actually this, um, now that I think about it. So this is not actually that interesting from that perspective. Um, something like this. So anyway, that's that's kind of the, the broad idea for how I imagine some of this stuff around positions will work. Of course, like I said, binary search, these are all sorted and these are naturally produced in sorted order, so you don't have to sort them, right? The files, we, we, we don't parse files recursively, we parse them like with a queue. And so we don't, we're, we're totally finished with one file before we proceed to the next file in terms of this level of the processing. Um, unlike the resolving, which is a totally nonlinear process. Um, and so all of these things will be naturally sorted within files and uh, you can do binary search. Um, yeah, that's kind of the idea. Some of these are subject to change, but that's, I, I just want you to show, I want you to see the kind of approach that you probably want to take. I mean, some of these are like, there are plenty of degrees of freedom here that a reasonable design could, could uh, t tweak, but I think something like this is in the right direction for that. Um, Probably if we do this, the default parser shouldn't have a tokens list. I think that's the right call. Um, it just has an offsets list. All right, for the token struct itself, this looks mostly fine, I think. Um, so this would be a uint uh, uint six, uh, 32, a uint 32. There wouldn't be a source position because this would be um, actually, let me think. Tokens don't, so now tokens won't have source positions, but actually, because they're, they know they're offset within their file, but a, a token on its own, you cannot use to get a source position. Uh, you have to couple it, from, from, from a position, a post, you can get both the token and the source position, because that's essentially a, a, a table index into these associated tables. A token by itself will not store that data, I think, unless there's a very good reason to. Um, so generally you want to work with positions rather than tokens because the position always lets you get the token. Not, but vice versa, you don't store enough information to recover the source file because it's not necessary. Um, okay. Okay, then we have a bunch of error handling that's not going to belong here. The way I'm going to handle error handling in general um, so we talked about recovery, sort of panic and recover style stuff, and that's what I'm going to do. However, in addition, um, you do actually want callbacks for some things. So I talked before about how callbacks shouldn't be necessary to use the system. A case where you do want to use callbacks with very large warning signs and stuff like that um, is, no pun intended, uh, since we're talking about, this is a warning example, is sometimes it is useful to get callbacks as things happen in order to figure out something to do. Generally speaking though, the correct way to do this sort of thing is to rather than print it, you accumulate it into not like a text buffer of text messages, but into a buffer of, of data structures that is like, here is a compiler message or a note or whatever, like an info buffer that you can then also render differently. So for example, 
if you wanted to generate markup or uh, you know color coded text or you know you wanted to parse it by some other tool, then you don't want to have to do text parsing. You should just be able to consume that struct. So most of this kind of error reporting will turn into um, some kind of mechanism for accumulating messages, like structured messages, I guess, um, rather than just printing it to the screen. And then that way, a library can just look over them. Like if you use something, actually, it's not the best example in other ways, but if you use like any of the shader compiler APIs, like the, the D3DX shader compiler or the uh, GLSL shader compiler. I mean, th those APIs I actually have problems with. They're a little bit annoying to use, but you know, like the idea that you get some kind of info object or whatever they call it that will give you information about what went wrong. You want things to be in a little more structured form than they provide, I think, but uh, that's the rough idea of what you want to do. Um, errors, okay. I mean, errors that are that just kind of accumulate, that's fine. Things that are fatal errors, that's kind of a different case. That may also provoke the creation of a message, but the primary outcome is to panic, right? So that's what we will use our new recovery mechanism for. Um, and yeah, so maybe actually we don't need callbacks for any of this. I, I think originally I was thinking about maybe for some of these info things, we would use callbacks rather than data structures. I think the correct move is to use data structures. And then the application can parse the data structures afterward uh, or whatever. Um, Token info, yep. All of this table-driven stuff, I think, will just transfer over, uh, hopefully cleaner because of various quality of life improvements. But this here just looks like generic C code. This should copy and paste over, more or less. Um, escape to char, yep. So this is just straightforward code that should copy and paste. I'll probably rewrite it, but... Um, Point being, there's there's nothing that provokes my ire. Seriously, let's see here. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, I actually don't want to read them in text mode because I want to be able to do that mapping. Um, but that is annoying. You have to deal with the fact that different platforms prefer different line, line encodings, uh, line end, new line encodings. Um, okay, the stuff that we'll have to change is this. So uh, one nice thing is we have case ranges where you can specify ranges, uh, ASCII ranges, and also numerical ranges. So stuff like this you can do, I think I implemented this. You can just do this. So all these things will become massively less redundant. Um, and certainly we have actually two cases you can do. You can do this. You, you, you can do that sort of thing, but I think you can also do I believe I implemented these ranges. So that will be nice. The thing that yeah, the thing that we'll have to change is some of the shared code using the macros for some of these small decision trees where you have, you know, one character or two characters or even three characters that have like a small decision tree where after seeing the first character, there's still a number of remaining cases you have to handle. Uh, these macros are nice for that. Um, but you can just do it using a function. You just use inline functions. Like, for example, let's take this, the hardest case, like the, the case three one. You just use inline functions. Um, so, I mean, let's just call it case three, even though that's a terrible name, but uh, just to keep things kind of consistent. Um, and probably there has to be some extra parameters for um, Let me just signify that there's going to be some context parameters that are currently level variables. But basically, there's no reason you can't just <laughs> write this code verbatim, right? Um,
hope we have an else, or I guess the, the, the default function is what, um, oh right, no, there, there is no error handling because as soon as you've recognized the first thing, then everything else is, um, is good. So we don't need C1 actually. So yeah, I mean, you would just do this and then you do case colon um, case three self toke um, since it's an inline. So yeah, let's mark this inline. Actually, what we do. Write it more functional. Let's use any shorter, shorter names, and that's it. <sighs> so that's exactly, well, it's not exactly, I guess it's like a tiny bit, a few characters per case more than the old code. Um, The inline directive is, um, what do you, what do you want to call it? It's force inline, so you can use this for things that you really want to ensure are macro-like in terms of being truly inlined uh, and stuff. Uh, incidentally, there's now also no inline, which is useful if you want to do hot-cold splitting. But uh, yeah. Um, OK, so that's the kind of thing that will handle that. And it will have a, need to have a better name than case three, but um, you can see how this is, I think, a better version of that code, basically. As as much sharing of code, uh, a, 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 a minute a minute amount more typing, but overall, I think less typing because of these savings with case ranges and whatnot, case lists. Um, Yeah, so that's almost it. The other thing is um, I realized is that these things don't belong in the lexer. These are actually helpers that belong in the parser. Um, it might, no, I don't think, unless you want to write a part, I mean, you, maybe you want to put them there, but I, I don't think so. I think these actually belong in the parser because they're kind of taking a recursive parsing descent interface with Lexer, which is really about parsing rather than lexing. Um, I guess I could conceive that someone third party might want to write their own parser using our Lexer, in which case maybe this would be helpful, but it doesn't, to me, it doesn't belong in the Lexer is, is the, the, the point. These things do, these are about, hey, is this thing, whatever, uh, what, is it a name or a keyword or whatever? These things do belong in the Lexer, but the rest of it doesn't. So, um, in my mind, I just wrote the entire new code for this. Like that's everything I would change. And the stream's already been going along, so I'm not actually going to write out these 800 lines. I'm going to do that off stream. But um, those are, I think, all the changes I'm going to make that are substantial. Um, we're going to change how source info is stored. We're going to use more table-based stuff for some of these things with the keywords. We're going to move all the macros just to inline functions. Um, and some things are going into different modules. That's basically, the main thing that's going to change. Oh, and then of course, everything will be wrapped up into an explicit object rather than being passed around with um, as global variables. And um, and that will entail having, you know, the, an encapsulated memory management uh, structure like arenas for uh, the intern names and dynamic buffers for the, um, what do we call them? And maybe these won't actually be in the Lexer, but they will be in some sort of separate source manager. 
uh, for the, uh, what, what, what did I call it, offsets and files lists. But yeah, those are basically the changes that are going to happen, and uh, I will write them off stream. And um, next time, we will hopefully either put the finishing touchers on the new Lexer uh, and then work on the parser. But that's basically, the parser is not um, going to see fundamental changes. Actually, neither is the parser, but the parser, the thing that is going to see more fundamental changes is the AST. So I think next time we will spend a bunch of time talking about AST representations and how to do that properly. And keep in mind, one of the one thing I didn't talk about when I'm talking about rewriting the code is that a main focus of the new code base is going to be libraryfication, APIfication. So it's not just about what's convenient for us as, as writing the particular new ion compiler. It's about exposing an API. So um, Right now, I'm not focusing on the API per se, but I'm thinking about it every every time I'm making a choice of representation for data, I'm thinking about how does this affect the library user, and if it becomes intolerable, then even if there's a performance cost, uh, I'm going to lean towards uh, API usability. So that's going to be kind of a consistent lens that we will use in the rewrite is, how will this affect someone who just wants to write a simple tool that consumes this data structure or this API? Uh, anyway, that's it for me. Um, next stream will be in two days. Uh, I think we'll cover AST stuff, the new AST design that I've been tinkering with. So um, that's it for me. And uh, I'm. Oh, by the way, I, I, I said I would push my code, my new compiler code. I, I actually have it ready to push today. Uh, the one caveat is that I almost certainly expect it will break a bunch of compilers um, on different platforms because I don't want to test everything before I push it because I have so much stuff buffered up. So I kind of want to get it out there and um, and then we'll spend the next few days fixing issues if they arise. So sorry about that. This was sort of unusual in the sense that we have so much saved up and I'm out of practice with uh, sort of source control discipline. So uh, that will go out right after the stream, maybe in a few hours. And uh, but, but, but expect there to be some some breaking changes if you're not working on Windows in exactly the way I'm working, but I will catch up with those uh, in the coming days. So that's it for me, and I will see you guys on Wednesday.